Good morning um, and welcome to the 18th meeting uh, in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone um, in the room at this point, as you usually do, to switch off uh, mobile phones uh, as they can often interfere with uh, the sound system. But I would also uh, ask you to note um, uh, um, that uh, there, there are obviously uh, committee members in class using um, um, mobile devices instead of the hard uh, copies of the papers. Um, I've received a, an apology this morning from Lynette Millen, um, uh, who unfortunately can't be with us. Uh, and I've, uh, we move now to our first item on the agenda today, which is an evidence session with health and care regulators, and we'll um, have, have some focus on the issue of palliative care. Uh, this is to inform the uh, committee uh, uh, and its approach to the forthcoming uh, forthcoming inquiry on that issue. Uh, can I welcome this morning um, uh, Rami Okasha, uh, Director of Strategic Development, and Elaine McLean, Professional Advisor, Palliative Care from the Care Inspector um, uh, uh, and uh, Health Improvement Service this morning. Is that right? Yeah, Jackie. Jackie. Uh, Jackie McCree, Head of Quality Care. Uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, I was ahead of myself there, Jackie, welcome. Uh, Nikki McLean, Director of Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, welcome to you all this morning. Um, we're going to go directly, if that's okay, to questions this morning. Our first question is from Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, good morning. I think one of the things about palliative care is that um, we need to understand it better. And one of the things I perhaps would like to start off with you is, do we need to have a discussion about uh, death and dying much earlier? Uh, so do families and patients need to have this discussion with, the, say, their GPs at a much earlier stage than we currently do? And would that lead to an improvement of palliative care? Um, we'd like to... Since it's on an improvement, why don't we start with HIS? Because we're talking about improvement as well. Oh, can be. <laughs> so um, the answer to that from this and previous other work that I've done is yes. Um, it would be helpful for patients to have the discussion earlier. It's not something through our current inspection programmes that we're looking at specifically. So in terms of evidence from inspection from our um, inspection program of older people in acute hospitals for example we touch on palliative end of life care through the different themes that we look at through our strategic inspections of adult services that we do with the care inspector again we are looking at um, services in the wider sense some of the people and individuals that we speak with will be at end of life but some won't be so in terms of my ability to respond to the specific question and evidence, then I'm not sure we have enough to support that from our current work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. I mean, one of the important things is, is absolutely about having those conversations at the point where people are able to make informed decisions and choices and have capacity to do so. And one of the encouraging signs we've seen in uh, care homes for older people in recent years is an increase in the number of people who, at the point which they have died, have had an anticipatory care plan where some of these issues have been discussed and um, with relatives with themselves. And we've seen a rise actually um, from 38% in 2012 to 62% last year. So mm -hmm. a, a relatively significant <coughs> increase at that point. Now, there, there may be very good reasons why someone dies in a care home who doesn't have an anticipatory care plan, but the, the rising number of people who do shows that more of these discussions are taking place, and we very much welcome that. Mm -hmm. That's in the care home setting. What, what is the figure overall in terms of... Well, that's in care homes for older people. Um, we also collect figures in care homes for adults. The figures are slightly lower there, as one would expect, oh. but um, I can certainly provide those if that would be of interest to the committee. I, I think uh, that would be useful. I think a lot of the, the experiences that people talk, they talk about end of life are sometimes in the acute sector, um, which cause some reputational damage and, um, yeah, to, to the service, indeed, from my case, work and I think others. Uh, 
So it would be useful to have those over all figures, Dennis. Yeah, yeah I, I'm just wondering, you know, <coughs> the, the discussions, I think we all agree, should maybe take care there. But I'm just wondering who should instigate these discussions. And in, in terms of if we've got people with long-term conditions uh, and we anticipate that, um, especially if we uh, identify that it's a, a, can, a very deteriorative condition, should we be having the anticipatory care plans set up? And, and, and if so, by whom? Who instigates? Uh, Rami, again. Well, absolutely. I mean, at the point where somebody comes into a residential care service, we would expect those discussions to take place. And I'll maybe ask Elaine in a moment just to say a few words about what those discussions might be and what they might look like. But one of the important things that we need to see is that there is a, a joining up of those discussions both in the health sector and in the social care sector. Uh, and that's something we've seen um, uh, some examples of encouraging practice in recently, but we would like to see further development there. And actually, as we progress down the route of integration, we suspect that, that the, stru the structures are there to enable that to happen. But I don't know if maybe Elaine would want to say something about the, the nature of those conversations and admission to a care home. I, I think um, when looking at anticipatory care planning, I think the staff and the services that we regulate um, should be engaged in some of the um, anticipatory care planning um, because they know the, um, the residents mm -hmm. um, and the people that live in, in the care at home uh, services. Um, and what we would expect is that they're, you know, we're looking for what does a, what does a person actually want? Um, how do, where do they want to be looked after? Um, where do they want to die? Um, do they have any resuscitation wishes? Um, has their family been involved? Um, and so that we can, so that services provide good end of life care, we need to have these conversations, and they need to be had early on. Uh, when somebody is actually diagnosed with a life-limiting illness. Mm -hmm. That's within the residential settings, but you know, how do we engage with this, a wider community? Because there's a lot more people in the community you know, who are elderly and, again, who perhaps have uh, uh, terminal conditions, <coughs> certainly long-term conditions with a deteriorating uh, aspect to them. So how do we engage in the community at that stage? Rami? Um, so it's difficult, I think, I suppose, in relation to your question about who should instigate an anticipatory care plan. I'm not sure that it's one professional or one professional group. People touch services at different points during their illness or during their time um, with health care. So I suppose it's about um, skilling up a range of staff and healthcare professionals to actually understand when is the most appropriate time to have that conversation because again different people at different times in their illness will be ready or not to plan for the future and have those conversations. Um, certainly through the work around our 200,000 days, uh, giving back 200,000 days to people from um, acute care, there is improvement work beginning to look at how we actually build capacity for improvement and, and work with service providers to improve <laughs> work across anticipatory care planning. You've got supplementary, Richard? Yes, it's a fact that Ramia was raising about making sure that all the sectors are on board. Um, in preparation for this meeting, I've been talking to a number of colleagues, and the, the recording of DNA CPR um, is not being transmitted, as far as I can tell, onto the emergency care summary. Now, I know that the pallet, you know, terminal care is supposed to be up there as a flag on uh, EMC or KISS, but you know, is, uh, is it recorded when there's a, a living will or an anticipatory care plan or an advanced statement or, um, or a DNA CPR, which are the four different mechanisms in existence for actually recording your wishes as to how you wish to be treated. So are we actually recording that on the emergency care plan so that when someone contacts the system, it, 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 it's actually you know, recorded and is up there? And, and in the case of the anticipated care plans in care homes, which I um, welcome the fact that's 52% and rising, but uh, you know, is that then on the emergency care? care? Um, 
It should be on the emergency care summary. The GPs um, have an obligation to, to complete an anticipatory care plan. Um, well, my problem is that the DNA CPR is not always recorded by the on that because it's it's actually usually set up within the hospital, and the hospitals are not actually putting it onto the emergency care plan. So there's a problem. Uh, and I've had specific examples of individuals just being having a really rotten death because you know, they were then resuscitated in the community because the previous agreement had not been recorded before they went back to their care home. That's very <coughs> concerning to, to hear that anyone would, would um, have a death of that nature. I, I think one of the things we've identified from our joint inspections with Healthcare Improvement Scotland when we look at um, the, what happens across the community planning partnership in terms of services for adults is that there needs to be improvements in the way information is shared between the health sector and the social care sector. We've found some examples of good practice but in, in some of our inspections to date of those joint inspections we've made some recommendations about improving that sharing of practice between the two sectors. In terms of in terms of the guidelines, just following on some of that, and I've taken an interest over a period of time uh, um, of the inspection of older people's care in, in our hospitals, and it's it doesn't read well over over the period of those 40 inspections, where guidelines are clear about screening for cognitive impairment, nutrition, and others. In fact, we're still finding. 40 inspections on that guidelines are not being applied and there's failures in that system. What would give us confidence, therefore, to go back to Dennis's, Robertson's question, that those other concerns, those wider concerns about the end of life, people's wishes, which have not been followed, unfortunately, and identified in some of those inspections in the acute sector? What would give us confidence that guidelines for end of life and palliative care would result in that end of life palliative care that we would we, we, we would expect and be guaranteed to people? Why would we why would we accept uh, a guidelines approach to to that and not a right to end of life palliative care? Well, the national, in terms of the, of the care sector, the national care standards play an important role, and actually the review of the national care standards, I think, will play an even more important role. If, they, if those standards, that there are obviously standards at the moment within the national care standards around end of life, it, one of the um, things that we expect to see in the new national care standards is a more human rights-based approach based around well-being, and that will allow um, us as uh, inspectors and regulators to ensure that the quality of care is being given is responsive and person-centred and meets the needs of the individual and, and that is very much the, the way that care is, is moving certainly in the care home sector for care homes for older people we see the overall performance in terms of the quality of care is good so most services are considered to be good or very good but there remain a small number of services at any one time who aren't providing sufficiently good care across the piece in terms of the, the quality of care and targeting our, uh, our scrutiny and our improvement work on those is very important important. So one of the things that um, we do is, is try to build the capacity amongst the, the, the workforce and assist in that. Um, I don't know if maybe Elaine wants to say something about some of the work she does around that, but ensuring that there is good knowledge and confident staff within care services is absolutely critical but to but deliver. I mean, you figures, 45 per cent of the 1,000 and odd patients that we reviewed did not receive screening for con cognitive impairment. For it, the, uh, the guidelines are in place, mm -hmm. the rules are there. When you inspected that, nearly half of the people didn't get that screening at that level. So how do, how do, we, how do we get to a, a stage where we can be confident that the wider issues of end of life and palliative care will be delivered in that setting when we're currently failing to to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to almost half of those people as, as the guidelines are, are, are defined? How, we do, how, do we, how do we have confidence in the committee that that's not an, an area we should look at? Well, we need to target our improvement work where it's necessary. So the first stage is to identify where there are failings and then to put in place the right supports, be that um, support from the care inspectorate or actually support from the, the local authority and the, um, the health board working in partnership under the new integrated arrangements so, so that the support is put in place where that's required. Can I just add a very, quick, very quick fact on what you've just said, convener. 
The latest study conducted in Scotland on patients admitted with a prior diagnosis of dementia, not requiring cognitive assessment because they have been diagnosed as dementia, 50% did not have that diagnosis recorded in the acute hospital. So it's even worse than what the convener was saying. It's a disgrace. It's a total disgrace that people with existing dementia are not actually having that recorded on their notes in the hospital. And therefore, how can we expect care to be good for people with dementia in hospital when that is the case? That's in the British Journal of Psychiatry and it was published last year and it was a Scottish study. Jackie wants to respond to that. Yeah, so, um, from our inspections of old, you know, older people's care in our acute hospitals, we certainly know that there are issues, particularly actually around the recording and documentation of information. And we're also aware of the impact that that then can subsequently have on staff's ability to deliver care consistently. Um, I think that in answer to the original question about why, how can we be assured that a guideline approach is the right one, I'm not sure that a guideline approach or any approach in isolation would deliver the assurance that would be required. So certainly around our older people in acute hospitals programme, notwithstanding the 40 inspections that have not really to date shown significant improvement, but we need to remember that in the first sort of tranche of inspections, they were baseline inspections on which boards were expected to build. Over the last year, we've been increasingly working in a far more integrated way with our evidence colleagues around developing the standards and with improvement colleagues to make sure that the work that we're doing around inspection is actually aligned to the work that is happening with our improvement colleagues so that we're building on inspection findings, we're targeting where support is needed and in fact now we are seeing far more frequently boards are approaching us, they're asking where is doing this well, they're asking us to come out both our inspectors and our improvement colleagues on post-inspection findings to run improvement events locally within their boards. For example, Lanarkshire recently has done one, um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde also, and Fife, and I know others are planning to. So that's really staff looking at their inspection findings and working together with us to make improvements across the piece. Yes, it's frustrating that that's not happening immediately, but it's a complex area. Dennis, did you wish to come back? Um, I really, uh, I'm, what I'm struggling with a wee bit, and uh, can I say at the outset, I accept that I, I believe that the majority of people coming towards end of life do have, you know, appropriate supports, whether it be, you know, GP family um, and, and, and obviously uh, the appropriate palliative care. And there are some examples that don't, but I believe in the, in the majority of cases that we, we do actually have that uh, respect for people at end of life and the appropriate services are generally there. What I'm struggling with is that <coughs> we're looking at, we would like to, we expect of, it's, it's, it's very nice, but would, would we not be better to have a clear pathway of, of um, guidelines and saying, this is this is what we should be achieving. This is a baseline. This is the pathway um, through the integration of services, so everybody knows exactly what is expected of them. Um, and at the moment, I'm hearing that we need to upskill. Um, there's patches of good. There's patches of bad. There's, there's improvement. That's fine, but do we have do we have timelines? Do we have a pathway? Do we have the uh, appropriate people giving that training? I'm not really hearing that. <coughs> Rami, maybe you could the, the, the Scottish <coughs> government is obviously working at currently on a framework around palliative care, and um, uh, Elaine sits on the national advisory group around that, and we hope that that will provide some. Um, uh, um, a framework for that action but I think when you're looking at improvement action in that sense particularly in care services many of which are, are not run by the local authority or the health board but are, are private companies or voluntary organisations the improvement has to be really targeted and localised so while a national framework is very welcome and important actually the improvement has to happen it, once you walk through the doors of the building in a sense so building capacity with the, with the, the, the providers themselves to make those improvements is really important. <coughs> Anyone else? 
So I suppose again, um, in terms of the national framework, um, it is important, I suppose, that services, yes, you know, there is a framework, there is a standard to which we all should be working to. We're developing the older people in acute hospitals, um, standards are being revised. There's not going to be a separate standard on palliative and end-of-life care, but instead it's threaded throughout the standards. So, for example, when we're talking about dignity and respect, we're referring specifically now in the draft standards to the conversations that we were talking about earlier and providing the privacy for these conversations to happen. Um, sorry. Okay, the, 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 your, your local delivery plan, the driving improvement in quality okay. of health care, local delivery plan, 2015 to 2016, doesn't mention end of life or palliative care at all, and it's 32 pages. Yeah, no, you don't see that as no, something that doesn't. needs to have a. It doesn't. It's not. Um, it's not drawn out specifically. But when you look at the pieces of work that we're doing across older people in acute hospitals, so with the revised methodology, there is an outcome for end of life and palliative care within that. We've not focused directly on that to date as part of our revised inspection process because we've continued to focus on the themes such as food, fluid, nutrition, tissue viability, falls, cognitive impairment. And again, that's partly allowing boards to develop on the work previously undertaken and currently undertaking around improvement in those areas so that we can inspect and actually reflect the improvement that's now starting to happen. That's not to say that we don't look at end of life care, obviously, when we're out in clinical areas. The large percentage of people in our hospitals are older. We're cutting across surgical, medical, front door services. So within that, we will look at patients who happen to be older and at the end of their life, but we're not drawing it out as a specific theme at the moment. What about our children, young people, adults, who, again, you know, um, some have terminal illnesses mm -hmm. and looking towards end of life and appropriate end of life care? I mean, yeah, I can understand the majority of people are, are in the older, older sector, but surely we, the, there has to be that uh, all-encompassing aspect of the, the palliative care to ensure that, and especially I would think our children and young people uh, have that most appropriate care at that uh, very yeah. traumatic time in, in, in a family's life. Yeah, so currently we do inspect hospices, as you know, through our independent health care inspection programme. Um, overall, the standard of care within our hospice sector is very good and excellent. Um, what we're not currently looking at, though, is specifically the pathways of care for children or others across our inspection programmes. That's perhaps something that jointly with the care inspector that we do inspect children's services. Uh, care inspector or the lead agency, so Rami may wish to follow up on that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we both inspect the pathway of support for children in any community planning partnership area, but we also regulate a, a small number of um, very specialist services who provide uh, palliative care and a care at home basis to children provided by um, CHAS, and the quality of those services that we inspect is very high, actually. Um, in, in terms of the joint inspections that Jackie was referring to, then we certainly expect, expect to see, and in many ways, see um, better um, sharing of information across agencies amongst children. There's more established uh, mechanisms around sharing information and, and working together amongst children's services and the, the quality of, the, um, of that joint working that we find is, um, is, is high. I'm happy to get back to the committee with any specific scrutiny evidence we have around um, uh, palliative care from those inspections. Nikki, I'm conscious that you haven't had an opportunity to come in and I, 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 I I think you do want to come in at some point. Uh, it might be interesting to know what, what role you may uh, play in the Ombudsman's, from the Ombudsman's office mm -hmm. in, in terms of this partnership so that, that are discussing all of these issues, given your experience, Nikki. Yeah. I, I think just to pick up on a couple of points that have been made, um, our experience, um, as I think we noted in our submission, is it, it is in relation to end of life care for care of the elderly, those are the complaints that we tend to see and they do pick up on all of the issues that we've heard about here. So they do, they do pick up on the issue of, of um, correctly assessing um, cognitive impairment, um, 
tri and and how that then ties in with treatment and things issues like trips and falls um, and I think that unfortunately the cases that we see are the cases where there haven't been anticipatory care plans and there haven't been discussions with family members so we'll see cases where there are um, actually there's conflict between the the, what the patient would like to happen and what the family member would like to happen because those conversations haven't happened. So um, I, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to, I think, offer very much advice and guidance on the benefits of anticipatory care plans because we tend to see the cases where they aren't in place and therefore we see the consequences of those. There's a number of people who want to come in, and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly get you in, but Bob's been waiting patiently for, for a wee while now, and, and, and I think I've got Rhoda who wants in, and, and Richard on another theme. See, I don't know if any convener, I, I do some things wait patiently, I know that, that, that surprised you. Um, um, just with, with brevity, I think it's worth also putting on the record from the committee that we were determined to uh, do an in-depth inquiry in palliative care, irrespective of the outcome of Patrick Harvey's assisted suicide bill last week, irrespective of this stands on its own right, it's the right thing to do, irrespective of that. And I just kind of want to put that on the record and maybe also put on the record that we've heard some stories during the, the examination of evidence on that of some exceptional palliative care work in Scotland and actually internationally were not a bad place, but it's still not anywhere near good enough. And I know members of this committee has touched all our lives uh, on a personal basis, not, not just in our constituency caseload. So how how do we drive that continuous improvement, I suppose, would be my question. And getting to the specifics of that, I see health improvement. Scotland uh, are developing indicators for palliative and end-of-life care, uh, PELC. And those indicators, um, and I'll just read through the four of them, are identification, assessment and care planning, accessing patient information and place of death. Now, I know these are personal stories we look at, and I'm sorry to go back to numbers and statistics. I know each individual story isn't a number or a statistic, but identification, let's just start with that first of all. I think Dennis Robertson rightly spoke about a baseline. If we're looking at how effective our system of palliative care and end-of-life care is in Scotland, we have to know how many people are in the system or trying to get into the system to get palliative care in the first place. So can can a starter be, can someone tell me how we measure that, irrespective of whether the presentation is with a GP or an acute ward in hospitals or referral to a hospice? I kind of don't care how that person uh, gets into the system, but when they do get into the system, are we counting the numbers of people in Scotland who need palliative care and then looking to identify whether they're getting the service they need? So how do we identify in the first place? How do we count the numbers? I think there's no doubt there is a real challenge to counting the numbers and that's been one of the issues with these indicators is actually where are these people because they're looked after in a range of settings. Palliative care is a journey, it's not a necessarily a distinct start and end point, well start point. Um, so there is a challenge. Some of that data is not held. It's not held in a nationally central repository, if you like. So there is certainly work to do around the indicators to actually make the capture of that data easier through developing a framework for that. Certainly, um, our director of evidence sits nationally on the relevant groups that uh, are looking at developing. We are actually looking to revise those indicators along with the um, standards for specialist palliative care, which I think are 2001 2, so again, significantly out of date and uh, are a priority for our organisation to review. Okay. Um, now, can, can, can I make a, I mean, this might be overly simplistic, but every person in Scotland's got a CHI number. Uh, information held securely, but information is held. And whether it's the GP, whether it's hospital or whatever, as soon as someone presents as needing palliative care or a palliative care assessment, it can't be out with the realms of possibility to flag that, to give us a national record of how many people are needing palliative care and getting a breakdown by age, by gender, by condition, to allow us to design services accordingly. 
Does that happen just now? Currently, I don't think it is happening. I think there is some amazing work being done through the CHI number that I've seen colleagues from PHI present around kind of high-end users and being able to trace at each point in which they touch services, developing that um, to make social care data gaps, district nursing gaps, uh, more evidenced within that process. So I think the abilities there, is it consistently happening? Um, I don't think it is at the moment. Okay, and would it, would it be reasonable for this committee, and I certainly will, mm -hmm. and um, to to push for that to to push for that to happen consistently across the country, and for us to ask for an update of progress in relation to that? Who would be leading on that? Would it be? HIS? Um, it would probably be jointly between us. We need to obviously involve colleagues in ISD. <coughs> what, the right thing to collect is not always the easiest thing to collect, so it's about making sure that actually it's possible and that that infrastructure is in place to capture the data nationally. Right, okay. I won't ask any more questions in terms okay. of the data collection, but I think there's an information mm -hmm. gap there that's yeah. essential for yeah. it. But, but so if, apologies. If, yeah. if you already say, you know, you know, I think it's, it's a great point. We should understand where people are and how we can help them before we can deliver any of these other objectives. But if, if there's no priority in respect to palliative care, or end of life care. They don't see that as a standalone. As, why would we be collecting numbers simply on those who have got a, Why would we be doing that if it's, if it's not been singled out as a priority? Um, it seems to be a contradiction for me there. Right, okay. So I think there's more than one reason to be capturing the data. So one that's locally for local improvement. We are, although we're not looking at palliative and end of life care as a separate system at the moment. That's not to say that we couldn't in future. However, as I say, we do touch across it, across our inspection programmes, and we will use a range of data and information to inform those programmes, not just in terms of prioritising where we're actually going to go for inspection, but also to help us focus the inspection once we're actually on site. So that's the sort of information that would be helpful to us, certainly not just in acute hospitals, but as we perhaps extend the scope out into looking at community hospitals, specialist units for people who have dementia, and uh, across our strategic inspections with the care inspector. Is there any other responses from any other panel members? Sorry, Mark. The National Advisory Group for Palliative Care, you know, have had discussions around um, data collection, um, and are keen that, you know, we do collect data about so palliative care. take a different care. view then? that palliative care should be prioritised or not? I think the National Advisory Group is, is obviously very keen to develop a strategic framework for action following on from the Living and Dying Well, the good work that was done there from the action plan, um, the recommendations made from that and then building in progress. Um, so I think they're keen to develop palliative and end life care so that there's equitable access across Scotland. As a priority or not? Yes, I would think it would be, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, can I just develop that a bit further? Give you okay, so I'm going to move away from the data collection for the moment. I think it's really important in terms of getting on top of what we have to do as a society uh, without, with, without that. Okay, so, in terms of inspecting the quality of those who do receive palliative care, and I accept there will be those who, who don't receive palliative care, and we have to, we have to give them that, that, that service. Those who do receive it... Um, how, how do we inspect the quality of that care? And I'm interested in the care pathway. This committee for some time now has said we inspecting a hospice or inspecting a hospital or inspecting a care home, it's a snapshot in time, quite frankly. And we have repeatedly said as this committee, when you get into a care home or you get into a hospice and you, you dig out the, the patient records, you know, we'd like you to go back six months, one year, two years, three years, five years, quite frankly, and look to see what the story is behind that individual so it's not a statistic. So what work has been done to pick 100, 500, I don't know what the statistically significant number would be, but 500 human beings and say they're currently in receipt of palliative care. Let's inspect their, cap, their care pathway, not just the care they're receiving at that time, but what their human story has been throughout the system. We've said as a committee repeatedly, that's the kind of thing that should happen. So does it happen? Is there any intention to make it happen? Any comments on that? 
Certainly in terms of our joint inspections of services for adults that we carry out with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, it's beginning to happen in that we um, have uh, carried out four of these joint inspections to begin with as part of a programme of Scotland-wide inspection. What we look at there is to see that services are working well together to deliver good care for adults and older people in particular. We have a specific quality indicator in those inspections where we look at the prevention, the early identification and intervention at the right time and that allows us to look at the way that palliative care is planned and delivered across healthcare and social care. And what I think is um, absolutely critical is that, the, as you say, that the care pathway is looked at, that we don't simply limit ourselves to looking at what happens in buildings or in services. And what we see is, across the country, is that in the, the four inspections that we've carried out to date, that in, in three we've found some encouraging signs of partnership working. In one further case, we've made some recommendations about the need for social care and health to work more closely together to get that pathway joined up so that people don't fall through gaps and that, that services are talking to each other and sharing information. I, I, I'm conscious that I might not have articulated myself very clearly, not, not for the first time, I have to say, but I'm not talking about the pathway, a kind of linear pathway in terms of someone's in a care home, how's GP services interacting with that, how, how's the support with acute services and anticipated, I don't mean that, what I mean is uh, almost like a timeline, so digging back six months, one year, two years, to look at the quality of experience for that individual. So we're assessing the quality of service to the individual and not the bricks and mortar within which the individual resides, specific to palliative care. So Mr Okasha has said that's maybe starting to happen more generally, but do you think it would be helpful if we did that specific for palliative care? Well, if we're looking at a long-term pathway for an individual, then... Um, it, I think it would be helpful to look more broadly than just at palliative care to make sure that all the aspects of care over a long period of time are provided to that person. And one of the things we do when we're carrying out our joint inspections is do file reading. So we look at individual circumstances of, specific, you know, of people, just as you're saying, and say, let's look at that person's um, the history of support and intervention provided to that person and make assessments about whether it was the right, whether there are lessons to be learned from that, whether there are improvements to be drawn from that. So, so that is beginning to happen at the moment. I, sorry, I, I just kind of the end of that. So we're looking at the files, but we also sample 20 people out of the 100 files who are using services, and we speak with them and their families and their immediate carers. So it's an early start to that work, but I agree, as we're looking more broadly at the quality of care across our services within Healthcare Improvement Scotland, we're about to go out to consultation um, over the summer on what that might look like, and that's going to cut across all levels of healthcare and you know we're looking at the scope and the breadth of what that will look like certainly um sort of following the pathway for individuals has been discussed as part of that and other processes so again looking at our um, current program of um inspection of people services in acute care as we're looking out to broaden that out to community hospitals and other areas one of the key things for us and one of the reasons and drivers for doing that is one there is a gap around community hospitals in terms of inspection at the moment but it's also the fact that at the minute we can see when we're in acute hospitals that sometimes things have happened up or downstream that have affected that person's care within that hospital at that time. So our plan is to look at having a more board-wide approach, and I know that's talking about the system again, but one of the ways of doing that is actually tracing individuals through the service. So again, it's not going to give you their perhaps the last six months story, but it's building on that and using that approach to actually look at the impact across services on that individual. Person. Convener, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't come back in. It's just reinforcing a point, it's not mm -hmm. a question. The idea of picking 100 people, 100 families mm -hmm. where there's currently ongoing palliative care or there was, and maybe the person is no longer with us, and doing an in depth drill mm -hmm. down into mm -hmm. their experiences and doing the same in one year's time or two years' time. And let's see if we really are improving the system. I think that would be beneficial to us. That's my personal view anyway, but thank you for your, for your answers on that. Thanks for that. I've got Rosa. Grant. Thank you. Um, I suppose listening to what people are saying, it seems to me there, there's a number of issues. One is access and the lack of access at all. And, you know, looking at guidance about people being treated with dignity and respect, I think we all expect that at all times 
But when is that in relation to palliative care and how is that measured to make sure that people have access to it? And I think then the other question is when people do have access to it, how do we measure quality there? So I think in a way, the first question is how do we make sure everyone has access? So what questions are asked to make sure that everyone accesses palliative care? Um, I agree that it's not consistent. That certainly reflected within our findings that where particularly across the joint inspections of um, older people's services that we're doing the care inspectorate, we are seeing some really good practice in terms of teams working together, endeavouring to provide access in a timely fashion. But we still are hearing from individual people through the process that I described around following up with individual patients and with groups that it is still a challenge sometimes accessing services and equipment so um, yes um, certainly uh, within Healthcare Improvement Scotland as you know um, we are uh, working with JIT and with Quest so building a bigger team around improvement and looking at across health and social care we've had additional funding into that program of work so some of that will be looking at some of the higher national level work that we need to do but a portion of that will also be looking at where can we target support post inspection as well so it's too early for me to say whether access will be a specific point that will be looked at through that work but it's certainly something that we know that's coming out of inspection that's still an issue. Could you explain JIT and Quest? Um, so the joint improvement team that sits within Scottish Government and Quest, I'm having a complete mental block, sorry, <laughs> improvement team that also sits within Scottish Government um, are coming together. So again, it's just so that we've got <laughs> a signal, maybe one of you can help me out with that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's looking at bringing these bodies together so that we have a significant amount of improvement talent, if you like, working across health and social care instead of being kind of working in silos across health care, social care, older people's services. Okay, but how, when carrying out an inspection, would you be satisfied that, uh, you know, a, an institution the like provided palliative care, that that was a priority to them? Because obviously it varies between person and uh, each person and their needs but you almost have to have the systems in green to make sure that people are looking in that direction and that is as well as you know attending to people's immediate health care needs whether it's cure whether it's management and the like also looking ahead at palliative care how how do you measure that that is happening because you can measure if somebody's getting the right treatments that are on the right care pathway and that but where does the palliative care fit and i think we're not doing that if i'm perfectly honest i think it is a gap um we are looking at we've um as rami said we've published four strategic inspection reports um there are another four inspections that have been undertaken that are about to different stages of publication and um, so we are about to review with the care inspectorate our methodology around that to look at you know this is all new for everyday partnerships at a, a certain stage in their development that we know isn't equal across uh, the country so it's a really good opportunity for us to look at with the breadth of these inspections and the vastness of them are we actually looking at the things that matter most and would be most helpful to partnerships going forward now it may be that within that process we have an opportunity to look more closely at palliative and end of life care to address the issues that you're, you're you respond? Certainly, just in terms of the second half of your question, um, which was about how we assess the quality of the care that's actually provided, I, I can certainly offer the committee some information around that in respect of care services. Now, predominantly amongst the services we regulate, we, we're, we're talking for the purposes of palliative care around care homes for older people, but there are also important roles that care homes for adults and the care at home services play. Uh, amongst the 900 odd care homes for older people, in Scotland and each of those is inspected unannounced at least once a year and where we have concerns more frequently and what we do is we ask services to complete a self-assessment about the areas of their strengths and their weaknesses we ask for statistical information once a year and then when we go in what we do is we speak to the people who are using the service to their relatives to their carers and we interview staff but crucially what we do is we observe the quality of interaction so we observe how 
how well the care is actually being provided to individual peoples. And that's very important when someone may be in an advanced stage um, uh, um, of an illness and unable to verbalise or talk with our inspectors that we're able to, to assess that. We have a set of trigger tools around palliative care that we use to, for, a, to, for our inspectors to be able to understand and assess what good practice looks like and, and what it should look like. And then we take that evidence that we collect, both the quantitative and the qualitative evidence, assess that against the national care standards and um, arrive at a, a grade that we um, evaluate the service as being on a scale from, from unsatisfactory to excellent. Now, we look in some cases, um, we in all care service inspections, we, we look at the quality of care that's provided. And in a care home for older people, actually palliative care is integral to the, the, the nature of the service. We also sometimes look at particular circumstances about how well uh, um, people living with life limiting conditions are, are, are viewed as being an integral part of the home itself. And when we uh, look at that particular quality statement, we find actually that the quality levels are broadly consistent with what we would expect to find uh, if we were to look at all aspects of the care. And that is that a very small percentage of care service care homes are unsatisfactory, about 1%. Um, and and that actually there are some that where we find care that's weak, some that where it's really no better than adequate, but the majority of care um, is good, about 40%, and very good, about another 40%. So th there is a good story about what is happening out there, but when we identify the poor practice, then that's where our improvement focus comes in, and we seek to work with the service to make sure that it really comes up to scratch very quickly. Okay. To add, I think the point about access and the cases that we see, um, and you'll see the uh, case that we actually put out in our compendium this month, which related to palliative care, the issue was about confusion around whether or not that individual should be w was receiving treatment or was actually um, needing to receive palliative care. So I, I think um, I think so we, we have to remember that in a lot of the cases, especially that we see, it's not necessarily clear that that person is receiving specialist, specialist palliative care services, but they are at end of life and they require end of life care and their families need to be involved in that care. So it's not necessarily an either or, um, but as I say, in the case that we published last month, it's very clear that there was confusion amongst and teams of professionals within the clinical setting about whether or not that individual was receiving palliative care or whether they were actually receiving treatment. On, on that, I suppose there are conditions where it's difficult to see, which are kind of, you may be able to save somebody's life, but on the same hand, it, it, it may be that, that you don't. So there, there will always, I suppose, be times when people have to have an eye on palliative care while also um, possibly looking at prolonging life and, and giving treatment. So that is probably complicated and I can understand where maybe some of those confusions arise. Yes, yeah. I, I think the particular difficulty in that situation was that the messages that were being given, there were conflicting messages being given to the family. So one part of the team were um, explaining that actually the individual was receiving palliative care and other, other members of the team were, um, were um, offering treatment um, and, that, and so the family were obviously very conflicted in that situation. Uh, can you help us you know, with this definition between palliative care and end of life care? For palliative care is a philosophy and end of life care is just part of palliative care. It, it really, the separation I think causes confusion. Palliative care is about good care when somebody is diagnosed with a life limiting illness. And really to get good end of life care you need to recognise that early on in somebody's journey. Um, so when I talk about palliative care it's inclusive, end of life care is inclusive. You, you'll not get good end of life care until you um, start earlier on in a person's journey um, because people have got to live with their illness um, through all their treatments um, and then eventually they may reach a stage where they're going into an end of life care situation. But an end of life care isn't easy to diagnose um, because many conditions, if you take, for example, dementia, somebody can be at end of life care for two, three years. Um, it's very, very difficult to diagnose when somebody's actually at end of life. 
um, and I think that's recognised in the guidance that's been produced, um, guidance for caring for people in the last days and hours of life. Um, it is very hard, it's very hard for people to say um, this person has now reached end of life. Back to, we're almost back to Dennis's first question mm -hmm. there. Uh, Colin, did you want a supplementary on this? Uh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, go mm, on. Go on. I'll give you a thought. Sh should, should we have maybe a staged process? I mean, it sounds to me it's, it's when it starts. And in a way, we all know at some point we're going to need end-of-life care. Um, for, for most people are going to need. So is it that we maybe don't start palliative care early enough when people are hale and healthy could there be a plan a discussion about you know were this to happen you know then this is the way i would be cared for and then as people's health deteriorates or people are diagnosed with something that's terminal and um, those discussions become more intense as, as the picture i suppose unfolds and you begin to realize the circumstances you may be up against and that then almost becomes a life plan that follows you throughout your life and um, to, to a stage where by the time you're speaking about it as being imminent and um, you've already spoken about it a lot in the past so people know your your wishes and and you it doesn't become a difficult thing to talk about anymore I, th I think that would be the ideal um, situation that, that it's, it's a cultural change um, you know to, to talk about death and dying is, is perhaps what you'd like to happen in the future is easier when you're well it's when you become unwell and then your wishes might change and that's why you need to start the anticipatory care plan when somebody has been diagnosed um, so that you learn about what their wishes are for the future no one else? Are you okay now? Thanks, Rhoda. I, I, I had a supplementary from you, Colin, was it, or another area? Uh, no, it was actually something, right. one of the answers that uh, was given to Rhoda Grant, and it was in terms of the uh, uh, identifying the gaps that appear. Um, we're, we're talking very generally here about um, palliative care as if it's... I know it's been, there has been some notice of the fact that people are different, but there are some serious difficulties, obviously, in certain conditions as you head into the process of palli palliative care. So I'm trying to sort of get my mind around the real aspect of identifying the gaps that you've said exist in the uh, services that we provide in terms of where... What conditions are we struggling to find a pathway to end of life uh, that are proving most difficult to uh, to, well, to provide? I'm not sure that we have enough information at the minute to comment on specific conditions. I'm um, just saying that you have a difference, obviously, between the way you would perhaps deal with someone who's um, coming to end of life and mm -hmm. cancer or dementia. But what about things like Parkinson's or Huntington's disease and stuff like that? The difference is, instead of the all-encompassing, where is the identification of what we actually require in certain instances? How difficult are these specialist services? Uh, how, how easily available are they? Can you, can you help with that, Lynn, in terms of the discussions you've had in your group? I, mean, I, I think we all, from experience, would recognise some of the best palliative care would be in the cancer area where, where it's been developed over a number of years, but that would not be reflected in other life-shortening conditions or sure. terminal illness. I, I think the thing with palliative and end-of-life care is palliative care is based on need and not diagnosis. Um, so really, you know, palliative care should be there for people with all life-limiting conditions. Um, that could be the neurological conditions, Huntington's, multiple sclerosis, end-stage diabetes, end-stage cardiac disease. Um, palliative care is an approach um, that you want to look after that person and make the care centred around that person, no matter what their condition. I'm, a, I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is where, is where are the difficulties in providing that? Uh, because just because we say it's palliative care doesn't mean to say that one setting is right for one person and one setting is wrong for somebody. It, you know, has, has an assessment been made as to how easy it is, for instance, to find 
uh, somewhere that uh, someone with, say, Huntington's disease can go to, because I know for a fact that it is incredibly difficult in certain instances to find that type of care uh, for someone. So has the assessment been made, or are we still talking just in the generalisms of palliative care here? I think from care home providers, um, it's really up to remembering that some are private providers. The care home would assess if they can meet the needs of that person. Which and takes me back to the fact how easily available is it, because if we're leaving it to the individual care homes to decide what type of care that they're providing, how, do we, how does somebody in Aberdeen end their lives in their own community, or perhaps they have to be sent to Glasgow to to have the facility f uh, that they require for their particular end of life need. The local authority has a, a responsibility around the particular individuals, but I think the point you make is a very important one about um, the nature of how and where services are provided. And actually, one of the things that is likely that we're going to see in, in future, looking to the future, is the changing nature of provision about saying, well, actually, for some people, residential settings are not, like a care home for older people, are not necessarily the right um, place or the place they wish to um, to to um, to spend in their final uh, years and actually that in some places intensive care at home provision might be what somebody prefers so it is important to make sure that there's a choice and that people have the ability to genuinely exercise that choice absolutely um, I don't think it's what was after but there we are okay I suppose the, the issue is you know we might develop that yes Dennis thanks um, is, is what choice is there and how we can create that choice but you know at the end of life I suppose is the most challenging thing. Richard Simpson? Uh, yes, can I say I think it's the quality efficiency and support team if I remember correctly is Quest so <laughs> just to put that on the record. Um, the, 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 there have been a number of points raised I find considerable interest. One is the research issue which hasn't been mentioned um, and I think that you know we're talking about audit um, and obviously the inspection system is mainly audit based but actually developing research so that we know whether Marie Curie are right that 11,500 people dying every year have not got effective palliative care I don't know where that came from but you know getting research into that so one, research, one question is about research um, my other question is the government announced £3 million for community palliative and terminal care some years ago do we know what's happened to that? Has there been any assessment of what's happened to that? And will the, in terms of primary care, because primary care, the GPs are the are best placed in the community to provide the final anticipatory care plan. I mean, I've just been through that with my mother-in-law. We had an excellent GP uh, who said these drugs should be administered if this happens. So, you know, they didn't have to call a doctor in to say that's going to happen. The drugs were there. There was a package that they could open and uh, you know they could open those they weren't having to go to the chemist to get it they were available 24 7 for that last phase and okay the medicines may have been wasted subsequently because they weren't actually used but nevertheless it resulted in a really excellent plan we all felt good about it and and the person concerned had a good death but will end-of-life care be part of the new inspection system for primary care which has been announced by the government and if so are either of the organizations are any of the people present going to be involved in that are you involved in having discussions as to the nature and format of that inspection process so my question is research to give us the information and uh, what's happened to the three million pounds that's been announced already and what's going to happen on the research uh, the uh, inspection system for primary care because they are critical to this delivery Nikki and um, I think we're obviously on the edges of this discussion, but um, perhaps um, two helpful things to know. Um, I know certainly Marie Curie are looking closely at our, our um, investigation report summaries at the moment to see if there's anything that can help inform their work, um, which I think is useful. And I know also that the uh, Scottish Palliative Care Partnership are doing the same thing. Um, so, uh, so hopefully that will support some of the research work that um, needs to go on. Um, in terms of GP provision, um, we 
we actually receive very, very few complaints in the, end, in the area of end-of-life care around GPs, which um, suggests to me that actually it's an area that is being done well. Um, again, in terms of GPs, our organisation is involved in that work. I'm not close to it, but I would be happy to um, ask for some written information to be submitted, if that would be helpful. I mean, I suppose one of the important points, we're obviously not involved in the inspection of um, healthcare services, um, but in terms of social care services, then we are reviewing our methodology at the moment, both for scrutiny and improvement, um, with a view to the new national health and care um, standards being in place. And, and, and th those will be critical, I think, to ensuring that we can develop a way of assessing the quality of care to make sure that it really meets individuals, people's needs. And, and I think that comes back to some of the points that Mr. Doris was making about making sure that we're looking at the real experiences of people as well, not, not simply statistics. Okay. Any um, other responses there? I've got one other question, yeah. and that is uh, one of the things that certainly I, I was involved in developing when I was uh, chairing our hospice um, management committee was in liaison from the hospices to the hospitals, or in the case of those where there's a hospital unit within the health service, getting them to liaise closely. And I just wonder, again, in the inspection system, whether we are ensuring that there is good liaison, because the hospices have, have really good expert knowledge, and actually getting them into the acute units so that they can advise people quickly on, on effective terminal care, um, you know, whether that actually is happening or not, whether that service exists in all 32 acute hospitals. I'm not 100% sure about the 32 acute hospitals. Certainly, from experience, there is good communication between hospices and with acute hospitals. Um, again, it's not something that our specific older people in acute hospitals inspection programme is looking at at the moment. Well, it might be something that you'd like to have a think about. Thank you. Has there been any assessment of that sort of what has been, you know, you know we see that there's good... It's between the two, not that I personally am uh -huh. aware of recently. I'm just wondering, that, you know, you, yeah. we, we mentioned earlier on, and, and certainly specialist palliative mm -hmm. care, uh, those who have experienced that and families that have mm -hmm. experienced it has been very good, but, uh, you know, and it's generally thought to be good, mm -hmm. but it goes yeah. beyond and the specialist and yeah. patient care. Mm -hmm. So what assessment is taking? What evaluation, what inspection, what... Of palliative care teams within hospitals, well, for example. Or within the, between the hospital uh, mm -hmm. and the community, the interlingue. Has there been any assessment so we can say confidently that all of no. these services are being, are, are, are to a, mm -hmm. a standard and a quality that... that or do we just presume that they are? Mm -hmm. So again, we're touching on it very lightly within our joint inspection programme. If we are speaking with patients and relatives who have moved from hospital to hospice, perhaps back to the community, but it's not something that we're formally looking at at the moment. Thank you. Is that anything that you've identified? Yeah, um, I think we, we've seen a very small number of um, cases that relate to not, not the interface between hospices and hospitals, hospitals but um, where people are returning home and we've seen a, a, so they're then under the care of their GP so there have been some issues about the transition from hospital to home and um, things like pain management um, we've seen cases that relate to that. Okay any other questions? Bob? Yeah um Thanks, Convener. Um, I note um, Dr Simpson again returned to the idea of identifying those in, in, in need of palliative care and assessing the quality of service. And I think we all need to be brave and fearless and accepting that the more we do that, the more we'll identify service shortfalls. But that, that's where we are, and it's a responsibility to, to, to plan forward on that. But what I was wondering um, was we talked about uh, palliative care teams in, in hospitals, and we've talked about various health and social care professionals. Um, who's the champion of the person who needs palliative care? Um, is, is there a single point of contact for the person and the family? Is it the GP? Is it a nurse specialist? Is it a social worker? There's a multi-agency approach, and I get that. And there's always, by its very nature, multi-agency approaches leads to potential communication um, uh, issues. And that, that, that's the nature of it. But 
is, is there a single identifiable point of contact in terms of providing support for the individual? And actually, given the fact that we are scrutinising the carers' bill just now, um, looking at the, the, the bigger picture, so not just the person potentially in receipt of palliative care, but the, the at-home carer who's actually providing some of that palliative care themselves and the support they need. So is there an individual who we can point to to say that person's looking at them, not as, and I did the numbers and statistics, but not as the number, not as the statistic, not as the, the rigid or flexible structure, whatever, but just as a family, and that's the go-to person to champion that individual and their family, who would that be? Certainly within their joint inspection findings, in some areas we're seeing evidence of good practice where there is a named healthcare professional for that family. Now, that may be a different professional depending on the primary needs of that person. Whether that's consistent across the country, I'm not sure. Uh, but as I say, we're certainly seeing, seeing good evidence of that. In terms of carers, um, we are seeing developments around carers' assessments being being undertaken, for example, but we're certainly finding that there is still a gap with carers' assessments and actually subsequently following assessment. Some carers are saying that they are not providing, they're not provided with the personal support that they would perhaps want. So, so again, it's one of the things that's coming through in our inspection findings. And is there just, I, mean, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that, but we, we really are just, we're setting the scene for a future inquiry we're going to do today. Um, who would be responsible for drawing this together on a national basis? I, get, I accept that in s some areas it might be a, a social worker who's got an interest, and in other areas, depending on the condition, I think Colin Kerr made that point very well, it could be a, a nurse specialist who's that champion, but a lead professional or a champion for the individual and family. There's some good work at a local level, um, uh, Ms McCree, you, you mentioned in relation to that. Is anyone drawing this together at a national level to roll good, this kind of best practice out? Within the boards, there will be an executive lead for palliative care. Um, again, that's not going. That will link eventually to families and directly, but there is that strategic lead um, as well as the individual local work. Yeah. Okay. It's maybe something for us to consider mm -hmm. as we, yeah. we push on. But, you know, in terms of, in terms of that, if there is a lead, does that lead um, uh, person look at the, the inequalities in that region, whether it's good practice? whether there is an absence or whether there is poorer practice, how do they evaluate uh, uh, the gaps, I suppose, or identify the gaps? How they're doing it, I'm, I'm not sure, but they are certainly linked in with the national groups and national work that's happening uh, at government and strategic level. So. Do, you, do you know of any of that work that what's going on, Elaine, in terms of and you know, learning from be be best practices, sharing intelligence, or you know, the ombudsman's office involved, and uh, you know, any of this in terms of their experience and intelligence. Not, not to that level, no. Sorry, it's I don't. Not um, no. Nikki, do you know of it's happening? No. Um, if I could just make a related point, though, I I, I think that having um, a lead person, um, and is happening obviously in certain areas, but. Um, from the cases that we've seen, um, sorry, I know this is slightly tangential, but I think it's a really important point. The cases that we see, the, one of the primary issues is that the people that have the most information about these patients, the carers and the families, are not being involved in the, in the discussions and the decisions around the end-of-life care. So, uh, yes, I think it would be really helpful if, if there's a lead person that has that responsibility, but fundamentally I think there's a, there's a more basic issue, which is we're not asking the people that have the information about these patients how to treat them. Um, and... And that seems a shame because they're the people that know them best. On, on that point, I mean, that, that, that is an extremely important point. And so one of the, the uh, indicators of quality that we assess in, in a care setting is, um, uh, is the views of relatives, of carers, of individuals who are resident in a care setting, because um, we find that their views are really uh, essential to being able to get an understanding of how good the quality is that's being provided. Yep. I mean, you know, the, the other aspect of this is not always clinical interventions. I mean, I'm thinking about care in the community and the objective of, and, and the choice of people to be at home at that point. And, and, and carers who are in on a daily basis, maybe up to three, four, five times a day, what, 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 
how we develop that workforce, or have you any influence about how you develop that? Because continuity in that situation is very, 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 very important. Uh, absolutely. We, we regulate and inspect um, care at home services and again th they are subject to uh, an annual unannounced inspection. Now the nature of that inspection is very different because the nature of inspecting what happens in someone's individual home is different to uh, the nature of inspecting what happens in a residential setting where we have the, the, the right of access 24 hours a day. So, um, But we do inspect those and we find the quality of care at care at home services to be good. We published um, quite an extensive report last year on our, our findings over a number of years and I'd be happy to share that with the committee if that would be helpful. But what was asking Rami was uh, are we moving to a point where we're not just caring for people to be at home and stay at home over a longer period of time. We're moving into a phase <coughs> where uh, as the objective uh, to give people choice uh, absolutely. to die at home and whatever you know so uh, it's, it's quite a different challenge uh, uh, absolutely. For, for those care workers who are going through that whole process of someone who they know for a considerable period of time, coming to the point of death and being, you know, we, we know that nurses and others are trained to deal with those situations. Uh, is, uh, are we seeing any investment in those, that <coughs> workforce to enable them to to play a, and, uh, and have a full role in, uh, in, in that sort of situation? I think that's a, a really important question and will become increasingly important as, as the nature of provision changes. From our joint inspections um, with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, then we found in some areas examples. So, for example, when we looked at the provision in Angus, we found that the proportion of older people who were living for the last six months of their life at home was significantly higher than in other parts of, of Scotland, and they had improved access to palliative care, including day treatment. So um, there are some parts of the country where that provision is clearly more uh, embedded and working better than in other parts of the country. So, so you, as an inspection agent, you're able to evaluate the, the, the quality of palliative care at a community level, or not yet? To, uh, to a limited extent, I think we would we would we would have to be quite uh, careful this, about the conclusions. Is this something we you've identified so, as a priority, as a, a, an inspection? Well, absolutely, and one of the things we're doing at the moment is reviewing uh, the way we um, scrutinise and inspect all types of care service, and how we look at care home services will be a really important part of that because they're going to become an increasingly important part of how people are cared for in the future, not just in terms of palliative care, but right across the piece. Yeah, I'm aware that was a conversation between Rami and us, but if, if anybody else wants to comment on that, no? Okay. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, convener. And it's, it's really kind of picking up, in a sense, in the territory that you were covering, because it seems to me um, our discussion this morning has been largely subjective and almost anecdotal. Um, Dr Simpson mentioned the Marie Curie study that suggested 11,500 people, I think, who don't receive palliative care or adequate palliative care, but um, if the committee was to come back to this issue, this subject in three years' time or five years' time or ten years' time, how would we know if things are improving, both in terms of quantity and of quality of palliative care? In terms of quality, then we, um, we the, the, the evidence we seek to present is is based on our scrutiny evidence. So we would be able to and are able to say, well, in this year, this number of care services providing this type of care were performing at this level. This year, it's at this percentage. And um, we also collect. Um, uh, and that's focused very much on the outcomes, what we observe the, the, the quality of life to be for people using those services. We're also able to collect um, and track more um, raw data, which is about input. So the number of people who, the number of care services where um, NHS Scotland policy on do not resuscitate is in place, the number of care services that have an effective bereavement policy in place. You know, th th those things are, are measurable and can be tracked, and we do track them. Um, what's important to recognise, though, is that when we're talking about people's outcomes, those kind of inputs and policies only go a certain way. And actually, for us, measuring quality is insufficient just to look at the inputs. We need to look at the outcomes. What's the impact of all those policies? And does it help people live um, better lives who, who, who are in difficult circumstances? 
Um, I suppose in terms of um, the debate, so in five years' time, how would we know that things had improved? We are moving into quite a different landscape in terms of the way health and social care is being delivered. I think we have a way to go to really make our methodology really robust in how we are measuring that. I think there are things that we are measuring around fundamentals of care that should be there for absolutely everybody, regardless of where they are, around dignity, respect, person centred food, fluid, nutrition, um, assessment of capacity, that we are now starting to see an improvement and hopefully that will that trajectory will continue. Um, so there are already measures I think in place that we can see, but we have to be looking at being better at how we're capturing and using data, how we're sharing that across agencies and how we're getting better at, uh, at measurement in general. So. Thank you. Yeah, uh, by our nature, our work is anecdotal. Uh, you know, our job is to tell tell the stories of um, families. So I think our our evidence will always continue to be anecdotal. Um, I think in terms of what improvement would look like, it would it would be around um, family stories, around um, better communication. Um, we wouldn't. We, we've recently produced a, a video with um, Ness. Um, that is actually a family um, where the mum was the nurse, the three daughters are all nurses, and they tried to bring a complaint about the end of life care of their mum. Um, and they used terms like, we felt that we were an annoyance, we were dismissed, um, we were intimidated to raise concerns. So good for us would, would be to, to not be receiving those stories, but I think also on the complaints handling side of things, it would also be that um, where families are raising issues, that there wasn't a defensiveness around that. And we see a lot, of, a lot of good practice, and I know we noted that in our submission, but we still also see a lot of defensiveness where people are bringing their complaints. So um, better for us would be that, that loss of defensiveness. If I could just follow up a wee bit, it just seems to me that in terms of our data collection and analysis um, and of presenting the overall picture, this always seems to be a work in progress, so that there's no real baseline that we can measure progress against and demonstrate progress against. So um, could I perhaps turn this question around a wee bit and say, how have things improved in a measurable way over the last five years? Certainly, in terms of the, um, uh, the 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 number of, the, I mean, in terms of some of the sort of baseline statistics, as it were, what we have is is um, uh, an annual return where we um, seek the same or similar information over a consistent number of years from care services and use that to to track whether the the, the indicators are going in the right direction. In a sense, so if we look at anticipatory care planning, as I said, you know, the the number of people who have died with an anticipatory care plan in place as it isn't from 38 to 62 over the last three years. But if we look at other areas as well, we see similar rises in um, the number of services. 38 to 62? Yes, from 2012. Right uh, across the whole country? In care homes for older people. 38 individuals? 38% of people. 38%? So, ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you. The, so this is the, the percent of people who, at the point when they died, had an anticipatory care plan in place. So had risen in care homes for older people from 38% to 62 So there is there is some improvement to track there. But um, And there are other indicators as well. So if we look, for example, the number of care services, um, where care homes for older people, where there is a bereavement policy in place, so staff are very clear about what to do, uh, you know, after at the point of death and so on, um, has risen to 84%. So, um, you know, the, 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 and that has risen over the last three years as well. So I suppose there are these indicators which you can track, but I suppose the point that uh, is important to stress is that they are all about inputs. They're about what policy is in place. And actually what we need to do is say, is that having an impact on the quality experienced by people using the service? What impact is that having? And that's where really the evaluative judgments that our inspectors make about the quality of care become really important. So certainly we've seen um, over the last three years across the piece the quality of care um, improve, 
but um, there are still cases where uh, the quality is not of sufficient uh, of a sufficient level. I suppose one of the things is that, that 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 doesn't mean that it's always the same care service which is doing badly. Because when a care service isn't performing, we try and bring it up to to, to the level that it should be performing at. So there's some sometimes it's difficult to sustain those improvements. So you, you see a service which is poorly performing poorly. You put in some interventions, the quality goes up, and then it slips back down again and, and that's the area that we really need to address how we embed and sustain the improvements that we see. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Responds. Any other questions for committee members? Thank you all very much for being with us this morning and um, taking part in this as, as Mike said and more of a discussion this is a we decided to use this um, evidence session this morning as a bit of a scoping exercise because we do intend to carry a, a, an inquiry in um, in the life palliative care, um, not not in ten years, but um, you know hopefully sooner than that. Uh, but thank you all very much for your, your your time, your evidence, and your patience this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Sus uh, I suspend at this point till we turn round.
We are now moving to agenda item number two, which is uh, an opportunity for those members uh, who attended the fact-finding visit uh, in Glasgow and the meeting with members of Marie Curie Expert Voices Group uh, for Scotland. Um, there, there was a number of member, uh, members who attended the, these sessions. Um, Bob, do you have any comments on the, 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 the group that you sat with in Glasgow? Yeah, um, yeah I, I sat with a, a group of um, young, younger carers, and, and I have to say younger carers doesn't necessarily mean uh, specified as the age within within the piece of legislation. Um, and one of the, a couple of things come through quite quite strongly for myself, and that was the kind of carer support that they felt they needed uh, wasn't necessarily support in their caring duties, because it wasn't just their duty to care. It was the, you know it was the duty of social services and the wider support agencies to care. But some of the support they needed was the support to kind of get on with their lives, so that their lives weren't seen just as a in a carer role, so whether that was support to facilitate their access to college or university or training or work or employment or being able to socialise with a peer group at the same age, that was some of the support that, that they felt they needed as part of any you know, carer plan that, that might emerge. And I, I think there was a, I think that came out pre pretty strong uh, in, in relation to uh, the people that, 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 I, that I spoke to. I think there was also a, a recognition that um, schools aren't always as attentive as they as they could be to to the, the carer issues of uh, young people attending attending schools, and uh, that that was of of, of some of some concern and uh, the, the the need and support that uh, other agencies could provide, whether within the school or, or elsewhere, was quite important. And of course, as you'd expect, the the, the issue of transitions came came up as well quite strongly. Um, so th those were my kind of initial uh, t taking of it. But the thing I was most struck with, I'll just to, to repeat myself again, is um, sometimes what the support that care young carers want is the support to kind of just get on with their lives. And one, one person told me in terms of respite care, um, what they were looking for was just making sure they could get their couple of hours to go to evening once a week and, and uh, and, and, ha and socialise with, with some friends. That, that that would be respite care for them, knowing they could do that, not having to worry about the loved one that they would maybe routinely have to care for. So quite often the asks weren't actually that that huge. They were specific and they were focused and they were unique to the lives uh, and, and, and their, their family circumstances. So uh, it was pretty humbling to, to speak to them. Um, and it's their asks are really important, but they're not always huge you just have to focus and drill down on what's most important to that person and uh, after, after all they just want to be able to go on with their lives as well as do their caring duties thanks bob is there any other one any, anyone else who wants to comment on the, the groups rhoda um i had a, quite a varied group i suppose what they had in common was um, a lot of them were from from more rural areas um, I had parents looking after uh, children, albeit adult children. Um, I had somebody who had cared for a partner who had passed away and others that were caring for elderly parents. Um, th there was a, a number of really good points that they raised. Um, they were glad about the bill and thought that, that this kind of provided a focus on caring. Um, so that was good. And also the change in terminology between carers assessment to adult carer support plan. Um, I think that they welcomed. There was a number of things I suppose they, they thought were was missing from the bill. Uh, things like emergency planning. Um, Carer involvement in uh, admission to hospital and discharge planning as well, and also what the carer needed as their personal outcomes, um, and how they went about living their lives, and also the ability for a carer to say, "I can't do this anymore," um, and and to be able to opt out of caring altogether. So I think they thought. Um, that was missing from the plan. They had concerns about the eligibility criteria. Um, they were keen that there was national, um, a, a minimum level of national um, 
criteria, which would mean that everybody had equality of support. Um, so that that was really important to them. Um, and they also said that when people were being um, assessed, that they not only assessed how long people were caring for, but actually the skill that that involved. Because I think a lot of people were concerned about um, what they were being asked to do and the level of skill that involved, and indeed how they were being asked to do it, because they were saying at another point um, that they were being asked to do things that other that paid carers wouldn't be asked to do in ways of lifting and handling where two people might be expected to do that if the carer was on their own and they were being asked to do that without any expert training or help or indeed equipment to do it so there was that kind of level um, of, of um, help and assessment required um, they also we're kind of concerned about the support they received at the minute being more crisis support rather than ongoing preventative support allowing them to care properly um, there was concern also about the advice and information services a lot of them had been involved in local groups that had set up in, within the voluntary sector advice and information services and they were concerned that because this was part of the bill, it might be that some local authorities would take this in-house instead of maybe supporting um, you know, good practice within communities. And, and that's why I raised that with um, the local authorities last week. I think it was an important thing where there was expertise within um, the community. Um, I touched on hospitals admission and discharge and um, they felt they weren't being treated as equal partners and um, they believed that discharge planning should be part of people should be discharged with a care plan but also that their needs were being assessed and um, when when the cared for person was being discharged as well and they felt an awful lot was being put on them. Someone said um, uh, that they felt they were being bullied, being asked if they love their partner because of the, way, the amount of care that they were willing to take on. So I think that's really important that carers be valued as making a contribution but not being forced into <coughs> making that contribution. Um, they talked about identifying carers um, and I think that, that is really important. Um, they talked about short breaks and I think that's something that maybe we need to think about because others have talked about short breaks and it's short breaks versus respite care. I think what they were saying was they're being asked to work long hours without a break so there needs to be respite care maybe as part of their day to allow them to, to go about their lives and to go out to work or whatever so there needs to be uh, that ability of care put in but also short breaks was something quite different it was about um being able to take a holiday um and for people certainly on islands they were saying that sometimes doesn't work by the time you get off the island you know you've lost half your week and if you're actually going to have a holiday you're not going to have um, that full entitlement so that needed to be looked at there was also issues about where your cared for person was also your partner you would not want to have a short break without going away on holiday with them and it was about facilitating that level of care within kind of a, a holiday situation that the right accommodation could be found that the right support could be found so you could go away together or even as a family um, and enjoy a break but that was difficult to do so I think that all had to come into um, short breaks and and differently respite care. I think the two were being confused and I think we need to be clear we don't confuse the two. Um, other things they talked about um, was right to advocacy, I think, which was important, but also um, the inverse relationship between deprivation and the amount of care received. They felt that if people were uh, articulate and able to stand up for themselves, they were able to get more help and support, whereas people with a lower expectation and maybe not knowing the systems, maybe not quite so articulate, weren't getting the care they needed. So they, they felt that that was really important that we tackle that when looking at a uh, support for carers. Thanks, Rhoda. Anyone else? Dennis is not here, so the, the, you know, the, uh, Colin, did you attend any of the? Yeah, um, I attended the uh, the second one with the uh, um, the expert voices group, and a lot of the stuff that's been said. Um, covered what was there as well. I think to cut my um, my comments to 
uh, fairly minimalism or minimalist, I should say, I would probably suggest that the, the thing came out at the end and one of the comments from one of the people who was attending was really what we're looking at is trying to get a bill for what is kind of obvious for uh, the difficulties that are there. When somebody is um, diagnosed um, uh, with a terminal illness and there is a carer duty that's foisted upon people, somebody somewhere has to take the lead in helping them through the bureaucracy of uh, benefits. Um, to take that level of stress off them, the endless form, form filling, the linkage between the partners and perhaps social care, local authorities, etc., etc., uh, as well as helping them get a handle on how to actually deal with the fact that they're living with somebody who is heading towards end of life. And cutting it down to the very basic aspects, those were the things that they were really coming out with, which was help in... in getting through the bureaucracy and then the help in various forms has been pointed by my colleagues. Thanks for that. Um, I, I attended the, the Glasgow session um, and uh, it was a group um, uh, representing minority interests, minority backgrounds um, and uh, as you would expect one of the, the, the issues uh, in that group uh, was the need to uh, understand and respect uh, uh, the, the cultures and the community of the people that they, they, they were caring, caring for and, the, and that, that was a, an important context that we're looking at, into that. There was a number of points, some of them already mentioned, um, uh, but um, the, the, in terms of work and uh, uh, employment, the, which was a, a, a uh, an issue um, where there, there was uh, an assumption that uh, where there was a strong family in place that they could they could do 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 everything. Uh, I mean, you took and to work self-employment, not necessarily dealing with an employer. That that that, 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 that there were there were issues here, and I think that's been mentioned earlier that. It's not, you know, just social services. It's the work situation and uh, the difference of having either a good employer or the flexibility of work can can dramatically uh, change people's uh, uh, situation and and, and their, their their care. Um, you know, following on on the cultural aspects, of course, of people, um, but the, the, the you know uh, uh, who provide support. The, the, there was also the issue about training for carer, uh, carers. You know, understanding of the conditions, what they can do, what they can do, and the recognition of that that, that line. I think Rhoda mentioned some some of that area. Um, and of course, um, uh, I don't know whether it was mentioned in the early other groups, that, that, you know, but we have recognised as a committee uh, that uh, we're all living longer lives, but the carers uh, themselves are becoming uh, people who need care for themselves. They are, uh, they are carers, but they, are, they, they, they have also uh, living in conditions that, is, uh, that, that limits the, the life and quality of life and uh, the, the, that, that needs to be uh, uh, re recognised. There was, in terms of the financial support, uh, issues around uh, flexibility, respite care, um, uh, 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 all of these things and I think um, while uh, I think Rhoda mentioned it was raised in our group, that Rhoda mentioned that a change in environment can be you know, a change is good as a break. Take them out of the home environment, creating a holiday environment for a family or people who are, are uh, who are very close uh, that they can both derive uh, respite and a break out of that of that situation, and they, they don't see it that that's recognised. And of course, if you're dealing with someone uh, uh, in a uh, maybe a terminal situation that we discussed this morning, then you don't want a break away for a week or whatever. You want to be there as often as possible, but you do need a break, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, within that that developing situation, which has again led us into discussions about um, the the assessment and the and, and and the rapidly changing needs with somebody in in, in a declining situation was was, uh, was 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 very important because people just struggling on, um, you end up maybe with 
two people in the hospital as a result. And, you know, and that's, that, that, that's not good for them as human beings and it's certainly not good um, for, 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 for the health service as, as, as we know. Uh, there, 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 there was, um, uh, although the people there uh, had access to uh, support and information, they, they valued the, in, in, in the independent information, they, 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 they value uh, the information services, um, they have got some concerns sometimes about the access of that, uh, the importance of face-to-face -face, um, uh, um, uh, information and dealing with people rather than phones and answer machines. And, and sometimes in a situation where there's a bit of a crisis developing or you're just feeling low yourself as a carer that day and you know calling on some support and you know what you don't want is an answer machine and no one to get back to you for two days at that at that moment of, of of crisis for you and of course as we know sometimes that breakdown in confidence uh, it, it can lead to an unplanned admission and whatever whatever we've heard uh, evidence uh, this committee that that that, that, that can happen. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the, uh, what 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 um, what uh, the, the carers were were were, were, were telling uh, me that day uh, was that confidence and continuity of services services that they could rely on, people that they could rely on, people who were valued, people who, who were trained and could do a job and, and, and uh, that, that, that's, that, 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 that was coming along, um, you, know, um, you know, coming through, um, uh, you know, quite, quite strongly. Um, the, the assessment process um, uh, is, is seen, uh, I think, as, as, as we've recognised here and uh, other inquiries, is seen sometimes a bit random, sometimes a bit ad hoc. Um, families not knowing or understanding the rules of engagement have become, you know, can become adversarial and very stressful. Um, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily understand the timetables if there's any being set. Uh, they, 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 they're anxious that there's no set process for review of, 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 the, uh, of the conditions, particularly when you've got a terminal illness or something like that where it's, where it's, where it's heading, heading on. Um, uh, apart from that, I, I don't think uh, the other areas that, that um, uh, the the, the identification, uh, the, a discussion about that, and there was an anxiety, I think, within the, the group that if we identify uh, more uh, carers, uh, then the question was put to me, why would we be doing that? And I, I, I suggested to them that, 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 that we were doing that because if we anticipated people's caring role at an earlier stage, we could help them cope and start managing them through that stage and you know, they wouldn't necessarily need help at that, that, that given point. But there was an anxiety that we started to identify more carers, then they felt that the limited resource uh, uh, that, that was already there would put pressure on them, additional pressure on them as, uh, uh, as carers. And I suppose there's a, a big transitional point there about how we support the carers who are already identified uh, and, and in some cases uh, you know, uh, don't feel that they've been uh, supported in, in all, at all times adequately, uh, how do we get to that unmet need uh, and get this balance that we don't, uh, we don't uh, put a question mark uh, on, on, on the care and the packages that are already in place. So there was a wee de debate about that, um, um, you know, and, and you could well understand people getting a bit anxious. But, um, you know, the, the, that, 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 that point uh, of unmet need and those carers are out there who, who need to be identified, who need to be um, uh, supported, maybe in a, a lower level or even just being identified and recognised as carers is an important one uh, for, for, for uh, um, you know, managing their situation. So I think that, that was a it was a quite a long you know discussion. The, the groups it was very very well, uh, very well uh, organised, and and uh, I think uh, as a committee, uh, those of us who had, you want a, a quick point before I finish this session. Duncan, carry on, thank you. My apologies. I think apologies to the young carers that that, that I met to met, met and spoke with as well because I've just 
consulted my notes and there were some things that I, I think they would be surprised if I didn't put on the record that I didn't mention. I'll try and do that briefly. I think firstly, I think the point Rhoda made about uh, the cared for person being in hospital and that lack of communication and a lot of young carers felt that there was no record uh, in, in hospital records about who the carer was and young carers have been squeezed out of that process. Uh, I think that's reasonable to say. They even suggested the possibility of a young carer's card uh, that, that could be recognition when engaging with various public services that they were in fact a, a carer and they noted there already is an emergency carer's card um, which we haven't looked at as a committee but, but it exists and it's, but it's not a universal thing so I wanted to put that on the record. They also made the point to myself which I didn't make uh, I did say that the bill didn't refer specifically to young adult carers rather than young carers but there was a feeling that because there's no statutory obligation to have service specific for young adult carers, that young carers and more generic adult carer services might might evolve, but in young adult carers don't get what what they need, and that there's a need for specific services in, in, in relation to the, to them, and they wanted me to put put that on the the record as well. They also wanted me to put on the record that any review process in relation to assessments and how. Um, if you disagreed with what the assessment was from the local authority about what a young person's support plan would be, what recourse do you have? What is, how, how independent is that recourse as well? Um, they asked about that and uh, I think finally, um, and I think this mostly covers uh, what, what they raised, uh, they spoke about a feeling that social services were not particularly good at signposting young people to support services. They thought that the young carer statement could be an opportunity to improve that but quite often identifications of carer came far too late in in the process and that um, they, they felt that deliberately or otherwise, I'm sure otherwise, convener, social work's primary view seemed to be um, focusing on the cared for, cared for person and not enough on, on the carer and their role within the process but they were hopeful that um, the young carer statement could could address that, but again, they they said it's about driving change, not just having this as words in a piece of legislation, but actually driving change at a, a local level. So, apologies to, to the young carers that I didn't put that on the record when I had my first cut at it. Thanks, 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 Bob. Is that Rhoda? Just a, just a comment on the expert voices group. Um, I mean, a lot of what they said is kind of reflected in what we said, but one thing that we haven't maybe highlighted is uh, one of them suggested a named person. Um, for people who required care and for carers to be able to contact. Um, I think that person was used to dealing with children's services and the like um, and worked in that situation and just kind of from our own point of view had thought it would be so good to have one person that kind of coordinated all this and that you could speak to. I think it made a really good point. Yeah. It takes us back particularly when we were talking about the earlier times where perhaps the, the patient so to speak is you know, an a benefit of some kind, but moving into the situation there, yeah, perhaps there's a change of benefit that's due to come through. Not everybody knows about the system and this thing about somebody helping them through that bureaucracy, um, I think came through quite strongly you know, um, at the end. No, I think it was reflected in both um, the, 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 the events. I mean, I, I think I can say on behalf of spoken to people who have uh, attended the, the Marie Curie event, that, the Expert Voices event that I, uh, I was unable to attend, and the Glasgow event, uh, there were a great opportunity for the committee uh, to, to, to meet with people, if you like, on the, 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 the front line of caring, not, not, you know, you know, and right across Scotland as well. Uh, young and old and diverse groups so you know a, a, a sincere appreciation to those um, who, who who made that possible for us to engage in such a way in Glasgow and here in Edinburgh um, uh, it was uh, uh, it was very very useful indeed and I hope that we have in some way reflected the discussions that we have which are now placed on the record and and, and uh, will will be considered again further in terms of our deliberations with, uh, with the scrutiny of the, the bill. So thank them, uh, those organisers uh, very much on behalf of the committee. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask the committee uh, at this point to move to agenda item number four, um, uh, which is uh, in regard to our annual report. 
as I said earlier, we're not expecting the Cabinet Secretary to arrive till about 12 o'clock. That will allow us time to uh, conclude uh, uh, our agenda item num uh, uh, number four um, uh, and, and return to agenda item number three when the Cabinet Secretary arrives and, and get a break in between. Uh, are the committee agreed? Thank you. Um, uh, item, item number four, uh, as I've said, is consideration of the committee's annual report for, uh, for, the, uh, for the parliamentary year from the 11th of May 2014 to the 10th of May 2015. Um, uh, and it's uh, the convention that we, we, can, we consider the draft report in public se uh, session. Has the committee agreed to the draft of the annual report, including change? You no, know, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, we need to get any, uh, you know, any uh, comments from from the minister before we change any, uh, from the committee before uh, we we look to any changes in the report. But I presume that. Uh, uh, the report being a factual account of of of, of uh, and a record of work that, that there wouldn't be any. But I'm happy to take any comments. If yes, Bob. Just um, I'm I'm fine. I'm not suggesting any any changes to it, convener. I just would like to place on record, given the significant amount of work we've done in relation to health inequalities, and in particular were were chambered debate on the 26th of March. 2015, where mm -hmm. we sought to get the conveners, advice vice conveners of all the other committees in the parliament looking to play their part in tackling health inequalities. That I'm, I'm sure this will be something that we'll, we'll wish to return to and work with other committees on because I, th I think it's, uh, it's something I know you personally as convener, uh, Duncan, we, we want to push this forward uh, on an ongoing basis. I just kind of wanted to, on, on the public record, draw that to the attention uh, on, 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 the, on the official report that. Um, our health inequalities uh, work will, will endure, and it will endure on a cross-committee cross, cross committee basis. Thanks, Bob. Any other comments? I have no other comments. Can I have uh, the committee's agreement to the draft annual report? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we now suspend at this point. Um, um, some more coffee, folks, if you can bear any more coffee, some fruit or whatever.
We now go to um, agenda item number three, um, which we agreed uh, uh, to defer to the Cabinet Secretary was available, uh, and we welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport. Uh, Brian S Slater's uh, here this morning, who's the Policy Manager, Health and Social Care Integration, and Claire McKinley, Solicitor, Legal Directorate of, from the Scottish Government. So I, I, I think uh, it was your intention, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to make some introductory remarks, and we'll do that, and then we'll go directly to, to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I'll be very brief. Um, Pleased to introduce our guidance on hospital-based complex clinical care, which we published last Thursday and which came into effect yesterday. This guidance replaces previous arrangements for NHS continuing health care. It simplifies and clarifies the process, brings transparency about decision-making and fairness and equity in funding arrangements. It's firmly based on the recommendations of an independent review, which reported last year, and I thank Ian Anderson, past president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow, who led the review. No one who has been in receipt of NHS continuing healthcare under the previous arrangements will be disadvantaged by this new guidance and will continue to have all costs met by the NHS as long as they remain eligible under the old criteria. In the future, however, the primary eligibility question will simply be can this individual's care needs be properly met in any other setting than a hospital? We want people cared for in their own homes within our new integrated services with joined up health and social care provision and vital roles for our third sector partners. As Irene Oldfather from the Health and Social Care Alliance said when welcoming the guidance, hospital is not a place to live, it's a place to be treated when clinically appropriate. I'm happy to take any questions, Convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first question is from Richard Simpson. Yes. Um, I said at the time that, that when this uh, report came out that I had considerable concerns. Part of that has been answered by the Cabinet Secretary's decision to ensure that the, I think it's 385 people who are, are currently getting NHS continuing care in the community uh, will continue to do so uh, as long as they're eligible. So that's a very welcome. But I think we need to recognise that there is now a, a very substantial divergence from the situation in England to the situation in Scotland, in that in England there are 60,000 people in receipt of, of the equivalent continuing health care in England, having their full costs met. And they do have a national decision-making tool, and they have an independent appeal system. And none of these things are going to occur in Scotland. There's going to be... Uh, no, no decision marketing make, making tool. Uh, as far as I can judge, having read the guidelines, there are no clear guidelines. It simply has this one question, which you need to answer. And the, the appeal system is within the board to the medical director, uh, who, of course, will be driven in part by clinical need, but will also be driven by the fact of costs, because if the health service doesn't have to pay for the costs, wherever that person is living, then... Uh, uh, you know, that will be uh, obviously a saving to the health board. So we don't have any independence, we don't have any clarity, uh, and that really does concern me. And what also concerns me is this, that I have no clear idea from the guidance as to whether somebody who is receiving considerable and intense care on a continuing basis and can live in the community but requires, for example, in a care home support, for such things as peg feeding or indeed ventilation, assisted ventilation, or requires specific and intense care for uh, problems including advanced dementia or learning disability with additional needs. Now, these individuals may previously have been supported under the cell 6 2008, but will not, in, as far as I can judge, be supported under the new rules. If I was running a care home in Scotland, I would be very concerned that I would having, be having to supply these needs in a care home without actually receiving the additional funding, and the additional funding necessary would have to be supplied by the individual if they could afford it or by the local authority if they can't afford it. And the last bit of this is terminal care, and we've just had a discussion on that this morning, and I don't know where that really fits in to the situation because, again... 
In England, care homes receive additional funding for all these latter things that I've mentioned. The complex care needs and also terminal care have additional funding given by health boards under the clinical commissioning groups in England. But in Scotland, is what's the mechanism for ensuring that these people are going to be in the community, are going to be at home or are going to be in care homes and are going to be properly supported and that is going to be properly funded. Okay. Yes, um, please. Uh, well, first of all, the reason that the review was set up was because there were many complaints about the previous system. That's why we reviewed it and the previous Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, kicked that review off and it reported and that independent review um, came to the conclusion that the previous system was unclear. Um, you could have a situation where you could have two people in rooms next door to each other in a care home, one of whom was being funded under the previous arrangements through uh, the NHS and one who was not, but with very similar needs because the system was found to not be consistent um, and that's why the overall overhaul happened, the recommendations were made. So with the, the simple question about whether or not someone's uh, needs can be met uh, within hospital brings a clarity uh, to, the, to the situation that wasn't there. Yes, it's a clinical decision, but it's a simple question that, uh, that has to be answered in terms of, of where the person can be cared for. Um, in terms of reviews, there obviously is a process in terms of a second opinion and then the medical director within the board, but ultimately the ombudsman uh, would be the, the port of call uh, beyond that if there is still um, a dispute. Now, Richard Simpson mentioned the position in England. Now, I have to say that um, obviously we have two different systems. We have two uh, different policy uh, positions here, but let me just give you some quotes from his position in England because I think it would be a, a, a mistake to think that the, the situation in England was perfect and that there wasn't complaints. So the Alzheimer's Society has said that there's huge failings and people facing endless delays. Experts are demanding an overhaul of the system. The system is not fit for purpose and fails vulnerable groups. It's a postcode lottery. The health ombudsman says that there are 40,000 outstanding cases with some having waited years for a decision. So I think to, you know, we need to understand that there are significant concerns about the, the English system um, and that it is certainly not perfect. And I suppose finally just on the different policy positions, what we should um, bear in mind here is that in Scotland we have 78,000 people benefiting from free personal and nursing care. That is not the situation in England. There is no free personal care down south. So we've made the policy decision to assist 78,000 people uh, here in Scotland who get free personal and nursing care. Uh, in England they have gone down a different policy route. And of course that's absolutely in line with devolution and around the, the policy um, decisions that we make here. What I would say to Richard Simpson, and I'm very happy to, to do this if he feels that this would provide some comfort for his concerns, is to over a period of say 6 to 12 months to review how the new guidance is working, happy to come back to committee with any information that arises out of that um, to hopefully address any concerns that uh, Richard Simpson or anyone else may have in that regard once the, um, the new uh, um, guidance has been operating for, for a period of time. Thank you for that uh, answer and I certainly agree that we have the absolute right to make separate decisions that are quite different from that in England and I also concur with you that the situation in England is they are finding they're wrestling with similar difficulties to the ones we are wrestling with but the, the fact remains that there are 60,000 people who are receiving full funding whereas free personal care, as you know, provides in a care home roughly £9,000 out of £34,000 of funding on average. So the, the, the funding having to be found by the replacement families for the 385 who are being supported will be £24,000 if they, if they can afford it. If they can't afford it, that will fall on the local authority, which leads me to my supplementary convener, and that is uh, what additional funding is going to be provided to the care homes to fund the, those who will now be looked after in care homes but will not be funded 
by the NHS. What transfer of funds for those 385, and it used to be considerably more, patients who will now be looked after in the community uh, if that's where they're fit to be looked after, but will no longer be funded by the NHS? Okay, I just want to, to probe the numbers a little bit of people affected here because, of course, no one is going to be affected who was assessed under the previous guidance. So they will remain with their full entitlement as before. So in looking at the numbers going forward, um, the estimates are that around three quarters of people who uh, will, will, will continue to meet the, the, the revised guidance, the new guidance, okay, and a quarter would not. That amounts to just over 100 people, okay, I'll have 112 people. Among those just over 100 people, two-thirds of them would be entitled because of their income to full costs being met by the local authority in terms of free personal um, and nursing care and accommodation costs, correct? That leaves around 35 people who would be regarded as self-funders for the accommodation cost, obviously still getting free personal and nursing care if they're over 65. Obviously, there's a separate issue for those that are under 65, but the vast majority are over 65. So, in essence, it's, I'm, not, I'm not taking away from, obviously, the, um, the fact that those people would have to pay their accommodation costs, but in the, the scale of things, um, it is a relatively small number of people who would be re required uh, to pay those costs. In terms of um, resource transfer, well, we, we're in a different uh, world now uh, because we have integration. So we have one budget, uh, we have an integrated budget, and uh, health and social care uh, budgets are now one in the light of the new integrated joint boards. And therefore, you know, the, 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 under the old uh, ideas of resource transfer from one system to another doesn't apply because uh, there is one system and those resources come out of the integrated joint board. Um, there really isn't a significant saving here anyway. I think we've worked it out it's around three million a year, which in the scale of things isn't uh, huge. It's not about that. It's really about bringing clarity uh, to decision making around uh, this system uh, because as you know the, the, the old system led to so many complaints about the lack of consistency and that's why the review came up with this. There, is there a, ever a perfect system? Um, I think every system will require, um, a, you know, th there will be challenges in whatever system but I feel this has got a simplicity about it that will bring um, clarity that the, the old system didn't and uh, hopefully the, the numbers affected have brought a bit of perspective to that as well. Brother Grant, I'll let you back in Richard if you want to question well, I was just I'm surprised uh, at the numbers and I'll look come at them back. closely. Come they back. don't seem to add up to me you but I'll, come I'll back. look at them. Uh, I've, got, I've got Rhoda and Bob first but obviously you'll, all the time you need. Uh, um, Rhoda? Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary said no one will be disadvantaged who is under, because there will, anyone under the old system will remain. That presupposes that people will be disadvantaged in the future. People who would have received um, this kind of support going forward will, will no longer receive it. And it seems to me, despite what the Cabinet Secretary said, that it does appear to be a cost-saving exercise. It doesn't seem to be coming from the point of patient care being up front first and looking at a patient needs and how, how best to look after them rather than how money is, is, is paid out and indeed what they would pay. What benefit in this new system um, do patients get? What will patients benefit out of this system? Okay, well, well, first of all, it's not a cost-saving exercise because there's hardly any cost saved. So if it was a cost-saving exercise, we would be saving a lot more than the £3 million that I answered to Richard Simpson. I mean, that, that is um, not a, a large cost saving. And at the end of the day, all of that resource is in one integrated budget. So it's not about saving a, a resource for the NHS. All of that resource is, is part of, of the one system uh, going uh, forward. 
Um, in terms of those who, it wouldn't have been fair, I don't think, to retrospectively apply a new, new set of guidance to people who had been assessed under the old system. So when I say disadvantaged, I mean that it wouldn't, wouldn't have been fair to have done that. So the new guidance uh, takes place from the 1st of June. And going forward, as I explained to Richard Simpson, uh, around a quarter of those uh, who um, are going to be assessed under the new guidance uh, will... Um, not uh, get their uh, costs met through the NHS. Three quarters will, as we have said, we have um, looked at the modelling. Three quarters will continue to meet the, the new guidance. Uh, about a quarter won't. That amounts to just over 100 people. Two thirds of those will get their costs met in a care home through um, the, because of their income level. So we're talking about a third of the quarter, which amounts to around about 30 to, th to 40 people um, in any one year who will require to pay their accommodation costs. They will still, of over 65, be entitled to free personal and nursing care. Um, the benefit is to, I think, fairness, because if you looked at the previous complaints, the, the, the complaints were based around a lack of consistency. So you could have two people living next door to each other in a care home, one who was being paid, uh, those whose costs were being paid under the old NHS continuing care system, and one who was not but with very, very similar needs. And those were the, the basis of a number of complaints about the old system. So that's why the independent review has come up with, with this system. And I suppose in terms of policy terms, you know, we, we want as few people as possible to be living in hospital. That, you know, the policy aim for a number of years has been to try to avoid people living in hospital, but for a relatively small number of people, that will be the clinical assessment because of particular health needs that they have. Uh, that is the only place that they can be uh, looked after, it would be in a hospital environment. But I'm sure we would all agree that we want to minimise the number of people who are in that situation. Mm. You, you still haven't said what the benefit of the new policy is to patients. Well, the, the benefit is, is fairness and consistency. I don't think it was a benefit to patients um, who or, or uh, people uh, who were uh, in a, a, a care home um, in a situation of inequity. I don't think that brings um, benefit. And I think the, the benefit is clarity. Those who do not need to be in a hospital, it's better for those people to not be in a hospital, to be in a different environment, in a, 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 a homely setting, either at home or in a, um, a homely setting. Uh, hospital is really not the place that people would want to be, but if they have to be through the clinical decision making, then that but it will be a, a relatively mm. small number. But is, is it not the case that under the old policy, people receive this funding out with hospital, depending on their care needs? What the new policy means, people will only receive this in hospital. So, in fact, what you're doing is putting a disincentive in place so that families and carers will try and get, if they can't afford to make that provision themselves, will try and get people to remain in hospital rather than in a more homely setting. So, actually, the policy could have... Um, the unintended consequence that more people spend time in hospital rather than less. Yeah, but the complaints about the old system were the inconsistency of some people in a care home being funded under that system with the same needs as somebody who was either being funded by the local authority or was a self-funder. That's why we had the review. We wouldn't have had the review if the old system was working perfectly well and everybody was happy it was all hunky-dory. It clearly wasn't, and that's why there were so many complaints. So we had to bring clarity and consistency to it. I've explained to you already the, the relatively small numbers of people who would be um, the, that small number of self-funders who would be required to pay their accommodation costs. Um, and I think in the scale of, of things, uh, that, that is a, a relatively small number of people, albeit I accept that um, they uh, are people who would um, will require to pay their accommodation costs. Uh, I don't think it, it generates a, an idea of people wanting to remain in a hospital because at the end of the day that will be a clinical decision. It's not about people deciding they're going to stay in hospital. The, this will be a clinical decision about whether they, the health needs determine the need for them to stay in hospital. Otherwise, they will not stay in hospital. They'll be in a different setting. But surely it should be gauged on a person's needs rather than where they are being looked after. Well, and if somebody has complex needs, what you're now saying is at one point they would have been looked after where they're 
whole care costs would have been borne by the NHS. And if they're under 65 under the new system, they or their families will bear the whole care costs for well, it. Well, if they have complex health needs, they'll still be cared for under the new guidance. That will be a clinical decision. But if they can be cared for in a different environment, then their health needs are not such that they require hospital care. And surely we don't want to be keeping people in hospital that don't need to be there. So they then would be in a different setting. Now, I've already explained to you that the vast majority of those people will get their accommodation and free personal nursing care costs met under the, the council, under the local authority. There are a small number who are self-funders who will have to pay their accommodation costs. Those who are under 65 are a different situation, but there is a very, very small number of those who are, are under 65. Most, the vast majority of those who are under 65 already get all of their costs paid for because of their income level. And of course, those who are under 65 are also uh, eligible for a disability living allowance or PIP as a new system uh, brings about. But of course, we are looking at the issue of free personal care for those under 65, and that will be part of our discussions going forward. Brian, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I think we need to differentiate between the finance and the clinical care here. People will still get the care that they need. Um, you know, the, there will be a very small number that might have to pay for elements of that, but people under the new system will still get the care wherever they are. Be it in a hospital, they will receive appropriate care. If they're in a care home, they will receive appropriate care. And if they are at their own home, they will receive appropriate care. In England, the system dictates that if you meet their eligibility, and, and does the Cabinet Secretary, it's very modelled down in England, and there's a huge number of complaints about their system. But if you meet their eligibility, then the NHS cares uh, for your personal care needs, your social care needs and your health needs. Now we have integration in Scotland that is bringing health and social care together. Why would we then want to differentiate between those and almost split them back up and say, well, that's for you and that's for you? But that's what this is doing. If we're talking about moving care into the community, out of hospitals, providing complex care within the community as close to home or in a homely setting, then surely this putting... putting Basing this on where you are cared for, not your care need, is the wrong starting point. But we had to, uh, there had to be a system to um, decide whether or not someone required very specialist hospital based care. There are some people who require that, who cannot be looked after anywhere else. Um, now, unless you're suggesting we start charging people for that within the NHS, which I don't think we can do. I mean, the NHS has never charged for accommodation costs, for example, so I don't think that would be the right thing to do. So there had to be a clinical decision-making process about whether or not the person could be cared for in any other setting other than the hospital. Um, and then the decision about where they're cared for is, is a matter for discussion, uh, obviously, around whether it's a care home setting or a, a specialist care home setting, or indeed uh, at home. But there had to be a clinical decision about where the person, whether the person required hospital care or not. I'll let you back in, but you, you know, we're not going Just to Just on the numbers, I, no, no, I think I'm going I've got to get, clear. You'll, you'll get back. There's, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why. I don't. I don't. I don't why there. There isn't any pressure in, in time. We'll get an opportunity to come back in. I just want to take the members who are asked again, Bob. Maybe I'm just getting a bit grumpy this morning, convener, but I'd maybe no. say to Dr Simpson, he asked five questions rolled into one over a five-minute period, of which I had a supplementary on all of them, and he now wants to come back in and ask even more questions. There's a balance to an evidence session, Dr Simpson. Now, if I could ask my question. Um, Dr Simpson mentioned that uh, this could be a, 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 an incentive to get uh, people with complex needs out of hospital because it would save the NHS money. And Ms Grant said it could be an incentive to keep them in hospital, it can't possibly be both. And we've had both questions put towards yourself, Cabinet Secretary, just now. So what I would like is just some clarity and assurance that every single time one of my constituents is assessed, they're, best, they're assessed completely on clinical need. No other issue, including financial issues, and they'll be at the most appropriate setting. And that clinicians do that on a daily basis and they'll continue to do that irrespective of these guidelines. So that would be my, that was my supplementary from earlier on, Cabinet Secretary. So can we get that reassurance on the record today? Absolutely. I mean, financial considerations um, are not part of the assessment here. And anyway, the, given the figures I've already shared 
with committee. I mean, there is no cost saving here. I mean, it's it, and anyway, because of the world of integration, there's there's no benefit to one part of the system. It's absolutely not about that. So I can give you that reassurance. Right, thank you. Now back onto the structure of it. Uh, looking at the figures that, that you gave, that was that was quite helpful. I think you estimated about a hundred or so, 105 cases for. Um, so, so we've estimated that there are about 385 um, people who will each year be looked at through this, this process, okay? Um, and out of those, there are about 112 who would, um, not be eligible, would not be eligible to remain in, would not be assessed as needing to remain in hospital, okay, under the new guidance. So just over 100 out of those 385, and these are obviously, you know, they're not they're not going to be to the, the one person, they're they're ballpark, but but generally it's a quarter of those uh, who uh, would would not be staying in hospital under the new guidance, and out of those, two thirds would be eligible for uh, their all of their costs to be met under the local authority costs because of their income level. I suppose what I'm trying to drive at is so the amount of constituents that are in hospital beds because of complex clinical needs won't change. So there's not a bed management issue in relation to this in terms of making sure we've got the right beds in the right place at the right time within a hospital setting. There's a zero-sum gain in relation to that. Uh, well, there's always a need for every board to plan the beds they require on a short term and a long term, and they've, they've got a tool to be able to do that. So they need to make sure that for their share of those uh, 300, and, well, it'll be the 385 minus 112, the 200 and odd people who would every year be requiring to remain in hospital, um, each health board will will plan for that, but it's relatively small numbers, and they're able to do that and to ensure that there's appropriate care. But people who are already under those arrangements will not be affected um, um, at all. Okay, I understand that. Um, the, the, the other thing I think going forward, so, I mean, I support the equity argument and not charging. I mean, the suggestion that we, we charge for accommodation costs in hospitals is just ludicrous. We, we just don't go there. The NHS is too important for that. But we do have a different situation in the, the social care sector. Obviously, um, now, as we develop health and social care integration, as the system develops, we may have increased capacity to deliver clinical care in a setting out with hospitals going forward. And I'm just wondering, as the system evolves, will the Scottish Government take cognizance of that to refresh and to review and to update these guidelines? Because uh, we have such we have precedents such as, like, in terms of delayed discharge, we have step-down beds now. Um, so in terms of if the expertise and the capacity develops at a local area where effectively it's clinical needs that are being met elsewhere rather than social care needs, but we can do that in a more homely system in a more homely setting, would the Scottish Government at some point review the implementation of these guidelines over whether it's one year, two years, three years, whatever that number would be, Cabinet Secretary, just to make sure what, what, what we're taking cognizance of the developments and the increasing clinical care capacity within uh, a more social care environment rather than a traditional hospital setting? Well, as I indicated earlier on, I'd be happy to, to do that. We can pick a, a kind of fixed point in time, whether a year might allow us to have a bit more experience of the, the new system. Um, very happy to do that. You, you hit on an important point, though, that um, this is uh, within the, a, a very much a changing environment where intermediate uh, care and step up, step down beds, whatever you want to call them, are very much a, a growing area. And of course, um, for that um, model, the, which is a short stay of around kind of four, six, eight weeks time, um, there should be no charging for that either, because essentially that is an assessment uh, of someone going home. So again, those um, those beds provide an an additional mechanism to help keep people out of acute beds or indeed get people home when they're clinically ready for discharge from hospital but they might need a bit more 
rehabilitation, they might need um, some aids and adaptations back home before they get home. So it provides a, a very important part of the system and we really want to see more of that, that uh, capacity growing across Scotland. Okay, I, I'll be interested to see how, how any of the review um, would be taken forward. I'm just trying to think of the medium term Cabinet Secretary where you, you could in theory have a clinical care units um, uh, co-located with uh, uh, social care settings. I know, I know there's maybe issues in relation to all the resources on site that you would need to do that, but it's just in terms of making sure that the Scottish Government takes cognizance of you know evolving patterns of clinical and social care delivery, but I appreciate your answer. <coughs> a, a couple of general questions just following on the, the questions that we've had. Um, I mean, in the term, and I think the committee's taken you know, lots of evidence um, and will be involved probably in casework. Where you've got an assessment, social work or clinical, you're going to have disputes and complaints and whatever about it. I think it was, uh, it was a, um, a, an issue that the committee focused on in some of this. It's very controversial when somebody's making a judgment about somebody's condition alongside the family, what's appropriate. And if you add into that mix a financial cost, so I, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, um, whether um, whether um, the system that's completely within the health board actually addresses some of the, you know, given some of the other evidence that we have taken about local authorities making that 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 uh, the, those decisions. I think and indeed health board with allocation of new drugs, new drugs and innovation and things like that. But where do you get access to these things? There is a board there who have got a financial envelope, and, and, and that can bear down on the independence of decisions that are making. I don't know where um, you've considered that and how you you would look to uh, ensure the greatest uh, of independence within that system. The other question, I suppose. I accept in, in, in the, schemes, uh, the scheme of the, the, the health service budget that £3 million of a saving is, 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 is nothing that would drive you on or make you make decisions in any shot. But it would be interesting to know where the £3 million saving comes from. Is that from a reduced number of beds or where is it? Whatever. But finally, um, uh, now, now that this thing's shut down, I'm just looking at my papers. Um, the review group, and I'm reading from this note and brief that we had, the review group in 5.8.2 5 um, recognises that the current situation in Scotland in which all those individuals aged over 65 are eligible for free personal nursing care is unfair and inequitable. The view uh, was also expressed by some voluntary organisations who voiced concerns that the provision of free personal care and nursing care is based on age rather than a clinical need and that at the heart is not correct. The panel believes, therefore, your review panel that made these recommendations, believes that there, there is inequity, in, uh, inequity in the funding of personal and nursing care needs for individuals under the age of 65. Um, the new guidance uh, doesn't mention extending free personal care to under six fives, although you mentioned this in a few. Now, given that strong statement, why, why are we delaying on that recommendation and pushing forward with it? with the others. Okay, um, I'll come back to that in a second. Just yes. on the, the dispute mechanism, I mean, I accept that there will undoubtedly, as there was under the previous system, disagreements and, um, but, you know, the, the process which was recommended by the independent review was that it, that resolution should remain within the board, so there should be a second opinion, there should then be um, uh, a case to the, the medical director to, to look at it all from a clinical perspective but ultimately um, the ombudsman is there as a backstop of, of an uh, independent look at whether the decisions are, are, uh, are, are, are right or, or whether the ombudsman would have concerns about them. I think that's the area as part of the a look back over maybe 12 months we'd probably want to keep a look out and, and monitor um, as no, part I of that. In some of that, uh, Cabinet Secretary, mm -hmm. just, just, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we, you're talking to the committee that took evidence on access to new drugs and medicines. Yeah. 
and you're saying that the medical directors and whatever, whatever, well, you know, we've took extensive evidence on that, so it's going to be hard to convince us that that that. that would. And the ombudsman, as I understand it, has got no powers to direct action on the health board. So if that was rather than the ombudsman being there, which is you know everybody's right to when when they come up against uh, a decision they don't like in public sector, they can go to the ombudsman. But we know from our case work, and you probably do as well, the ombudsman has no powers to direct uh, a health board or indeed other than apply to whether the procedures that, that, that are in place are adhered to, not, the, 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 uh, not in a, a clinical decision. So I don't know whether that's some, something that needs, we need to reflect on. You know, to, we, we can never agree with it. We can't ever. There will always be disputes. But I mean, if you've not got a final arbiter that's seen as you know, somewhat independent that can give direction or recommendations that can change something. You know, I think there's a big weakness there. I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm suggesting there's a significant weakness in that appeals procedure. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to convince you otherwise, but the, I mean, the ombudsman's recommendations and and decisions and comments on cases is. You know, listened to by boards don't ignore that. I mean, because it's a very public, very public uh, thing to have the ombudsman uh, find find against find against a board. However, as the Scottish government, we have a role as well to make sure that we keep um, monitoring um, that element of it. And I can certainly give an undertaking uh, to do so, and something we could capture after sort of twelve month um, review. The the issue of the under sixty fives. Um, we, as you rightly said, are looking at that. We have been uh, discussing with COSLA for some time. We're doing some modelling um, around... I mean, the biggest area of this, of course, is care at home. Um, the numbers of people affected in a, a care home setting who are under 65 are actually very small. As some of the figures I saw was... I think it was a 3% of, of the, the, the folk who are under 65 who um, would be kind of self-funders. And I think that amounted to about, about 90 people. Um, so it's a relatively small number of people, but nevertheless, it's something um, that we are looking at, but we are doing some modelling and some work. It is a complex area in terms of uh, how you would do it, because obviously there's various campaigns that have been calling for various groups to be exempt and for for it, for this for elements of free free personal nursing care for under 65s to, to be looked at and we are lo looking at that in a, a proper um, th um, review process um, with with COSLA and um, we'll be you know we will come to conclusions about that once that's come very happy to keep the committee informed of that I know there's a lot of interest in it what stage are we at with those discussions? You know, we're dealing with something here. You're moving on where there was a recommendation that this one and equals. So there's a wee spur on here from from uh, people who are set up to look at this issue, and arising from that, as I, I can understand, it's broader. So where are we at the stage of discussion with COSLA? When are they likely to conclude? Um, well, we've got some finance modelling research underway, and we'll wait to get that back to see what that tells us. Um, yeah, I was I was looking for a time <laughs> scale. Uh, well, I mean, we obviously we want to do that um, as in, in as short a time period as possible. Um, I'm not going to put a firm date on it, but uh, cabinet secretary, you know. <laughs> You know, you I can trust us. You. Whisper, whisper <laughs> it to us. I mean, I, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not looking for a drop dead date, but obviously, do I take from that that financial modelling is in the very early stages, uh, or or is is oh. are we into the process? Um, well, what is the, it, what's the direction of the table okay, from, we're into from the, the process. government? Do you accept the recommendation that this is inequitable and needs to be dealt with? Well, they've. No, it's not just. The review that's said that there are obviously a number of uh, bodies and organisations, campaign groups, uh, individuals who have all said something very similar. Um, it's more complex, though, because it's not just about the current um, the current numbers of people who, uh, if they 
were eligible wouldn't have to pay if you're under 65. It's also looking at what the demand would then be. So that's why financial modelling is important to look at the current um, level of a need and demand, but then to project that into the future. So, you know, I want to make sure that we've got all of that into a proper order as we take forward discussions about, you know, what is affordable and what can be delivered. But, you know, I certainly take on board what the review has said. Um, Brian, you were going to come in around the... Just on the, on the £3 million pound savings um, that, that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, that estimate is based on, on the 100 new people that would come in. Um, if, the old system, if the old eligibility continued, we would estimate the 112 people that would be coming into the system that would be cared for in care homes. The NHS <coughs> excuse me, would pay the entire cost of that care, so it would be around about £600 a week. So a very rough estimate, it's 112 times 600 times 52, comes to just over £3 million. Pounds. Now that's not a saving as such because there will be some uh, of those costs. Most of those costs indeed will be picked up by the new integration joint boards. Um, you know, we're not talking about resource transfers to local authorities. We are talking about the single pool budget of the IJB. So much of that will be transferring. Uh, the cost of that will transfer to the IJB. The balance of any saving will be reinvested by the IJBs in caring for more people at home. So making provision for the under 65 would, would result in a cost transfer to local government of what? Well, that would be, I mean, if you did the same for under 65s, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, There's very few under six, of, of those people, people, very few of the under 65s are actually in care homes. So um, have you extended that? Have you extended at the cost, right? Uh, well, I worked out that there was about 90 people, but of course, many of them will be entitled to DLA and PIP. So I think we'd have to, I think we'd need to look at that um, in a bit more detail. So there's no back. costings being worked out about, uh, you know, the, the, as, as I mentioned earlier, dealing with the free personal care for well, the that's 65. Been, that's been what caught up with the other review. It's not been done under this work. Um, so the work that's been done here has been around the modelling of those who are el were eligible under the previous guidance under the new guidance. We've not looked at the under 65s under this because that's been captured by the, the work and financial modelling that's been done elsewhere and that's not concluded as yet. So. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? Richard? Sorry if I irritate Mr Doris with my questions, but I do want to get things quite clear in my own mind. And I think I may be confusing incidence and prevalence um, in that you've talked about this figure of 100 a year, but of course they will not be replaced every year. So if you have 100 a year, that's the incidence, 100 new cases a year. But the prevalence are the numbers that are actually going to be involved permanently or over a period of time. And that number at the current moment is 385, as I understand it. So, you know, I think that we need to understand that there are, when you talk about a very small number of 100, I think it is the prevalence would demonstrate that it is considerably more than that. If I could just explain about the numbers there. I mean, we, we've asked ISD, we asked ISD to come up with these estimates for us based on the census information that they collect. And you're quite right, there's 385 people currently in care homes. Now, the turnover rate is between 30% and 34%. Now, clearly, the, the continuing care numbers have been coming down for the last seven years. Uh, roughly 30% of people are new on each census and 34% of people come off that census at each point. And so it's, it's, it's based on that to work out in, in the next year how many new people would, be, would have been eligible and would have gone into care homes under the new system. Yeah, so I'm right. It is incidents that we're talking about. It's the new cases, 111, but yeah. not the permanent census cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the census data is also questionable because it's just done on one day a year, so I know that was questioned by the review report. Can I just ask one final question from me, and that is, I'm also trying to understand, because we've talked about in the past, under the cell 6, 2008, about category B patients and category A patients, and really all the discussion we've had today, as I understand it, is about category A patients. So can I get some clarity around category B patients and code 9 patients, because they are also a group uh, that are of considerable importance. They are occupying 10,000 occupied bed days in any given, uh, in any given um, month are occupied that. That's 120,000 bed days occupied a year under the Code 9, uh, code nine category. 
All right. Um, if I start with the code nines. Um, could you just give an explanation of what, what adults within capacity? A, B, and yes, right, right okay. Code um, nine, yep. just for the record. Thank you very ca much. Cate right, category A um, is people. So we're, we're talking in the last seven years that we've done the census. The category A people are people who are in hospital who are eligible under the NHS continuing health care criteria, the previous criteria. We also asked ISD to capture information on people who have been in hospital for more than 12 months who do not meet the eligibility criteria and who are not delayed discharges. So they, they are not clinically ready for discharge, but they're not NHS continuing care. And his, over the last, it, it, it generally runs at around 500 people. Now, they could be in hospital for any number of good and valid reasons. Uh, that's category A and category B. The code 9 are delayed discharges, but they are delayed discharges that are out with the immediate control of either the NHS board or the local authority to discharge them within uh, the agreed discharge timescales, which in the, in the past has been two weeks. Before that, it was four weeks and six weeks. The code 9s are predominantly adults with incapacity cases. Um, who have come into hospital for whatever um, emergency reason and it has been deemed that they lack capacity to make their decisions. Now, if the family are in agreement, the discharge can take place as it routinely should. If there is disagreement, then a guardianship order, order needs to be applied for um, and it needs to be done through the sheriff courts and it's a very time-consuming process. It can take anything from three months to 12 months. Um, so that's, that's, that's the main body of Code Nines. There are also a number of Code 9 patients who are delayed in hospitals because the specialist facilities that it has been uh, agreed that they need just simply do not exist in the community. Now, it may be um, that within the Category Bs, um, there's an element of those who shouldn't be in hospital. Um, we, we don't exactly know that because they're not clinically ready for discharge, so the doctors have not decided that they are clinically ready to leave. Um, so that is something that needs to be looked at. But they, they, they will be in hospital for valid reasons. It may be long-term rehabilitation. Um, we don't break that down by, by reason as such. Uh, but they will be captured within um, the revised data that we are planning to collect, which almost brings the two together, that captures anybody in hospital who is in hospital for more than six months. We'll start to collect that data. And again, on a snapshot basis, um, it's not ideal. I would, I, I would agree with Dr. Simpson. It's not an ideal way to do it. But uh, until we have absolute real-time data on, on everybody in hospital, it's about the only way we can capture that. So we will capture that in line with the recommendation uh, of the review. We also have some work underway to see how we can speed up the adults with incapacity um, issue because there is obviously a delay in the courts and we're trying to understand what part of the, the process is the, the delay, is there something around um, uh, the, the role of mental health assessment and so on and so forth. So we're looking at what more we can do to try and um, make that process a bit quicker. That's very welcome and when I had experience of one <coughs> patient with uh, alcohol related brain damage where we, we moved him from the acute sector where he was of extremely expensive resources but wasn't doing him any good into an alcohol unit waiting a guardianship order but it then took six months and cost £60,000 waiting for that order so I very much welcome what the cabinet secretary is saying but I just wanted to illustrate that I think this is a highly complex area England hasn't got it right I'm not convinced yet that we've got it right. I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's agreement to review within a year because I think we need to, to look at it very closely uh, because one of the things Mr Slater said that was important there was if the specialist resources exist in the community, someone will be moved into that and will have to pay for it. If they don't exist, then they'll be kept in the health service and they won't have to pay for it. So we actually will always have some degree of inequity and solving that will be a a significant task for the Cabinet Secretary. Bob. Thanks, Nivina. Can I can apologise to my colleague, Dr Simpson. There's many words about used to describe him. An irritant doesn't spring immediately to mind, but I, I did want to uh, follow up on some of the questioning from, from our convener in relation to dispute re resolution. Um, and, and obviously, the most obvious way for dispute resolution, if a, if a patient or a family disagrees with the clinical opinion, is there's a a normal routine right to a second opinion or a second clinical opinion uh, as part of any process. So I'm just wondering, um, I don't expect you necessarily to have the figures at your hand just now, but how routinely does that happen? How confident? 
do patients and families feel they are in asking for a, a second opinion? And when we do that, of course, uh, we'd want to make sure it wasn't another clinician within the same clinical team, because there could be a conflict there. You know, if, if the senior clinician has said this person's good to go, it's quite a big thing for the junior clinician to then say, well, actually, I've reviewed this case. I actually think they're, they're not good to go. So it's just some thought about when this does eventually go, well, hopefully it doesn't go to like a uh, ombudsman's and the like, and this, this just works. But it's just a bit more nuanced approach to how we build capacity and advocacy, if you like, with individuals and families to ask for that um, clinical second opinion. Just maybe as we well, go forward, that might become more important. I'm very clear that, that patients and families should be made aware of that as being part of the process and we'll make sure that that happens um, because I, I do think that should be laid out from, from the start and actually the whole process of second opinion, medical director and then uh, ombudsman beyond that. I mean, I think I'm not sure, Brian, is there, is there an absolute guidance around, you know, it shouldn't be part of the clinical... I mean, best practice would suggest that that should be the case, but that's something we can take up yeah. and make sure that in practice, you know, there's distance between the, the, the first and second clinical um, decision-making. We can there, there are ab absolutely in the guidance they're entitled to a second opinion, and that has to be from a competent um, medical professional, obviously, in, in the same way as any other clinical decision. Um, it, it, any other clinical decision, not just about uh, eligibility for hospital-based complex clinical care, um, people are entitled to a second opinion. Okay. But yeah, we can, I mean, it, the panel was very clear. Um, they, they, they spoke um, to key stakeholders with a view to should this be that it should be somebody from a, a, another health board, for example. And they were very clear that it shouldn't um, because basically in a very small country, the health professionals know each other. Um, health professionals from another board are, are, are going to, you know, they're all going to know each other. It should be contained within that same health board. But I take your point about immediate teams and a yeah. junior doctor not, over, yeah. not overthrowing a senior we'll, doctor's we'll decision. We'll take that up and we'll make sure that that's understood in terms of practice. We can issue that as a, a letter or something. Maybe just a cultural and a conscious thing mm -hmm. among, um, amongst the medical profession because, of course, it could be a fine judgment call about clinical need yeah. being served in hospital mm -hmm. or, 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 or capacity within the community and where there is that grey area and there's, there's clinician disagreement erring in the side of caution and using the hospital bed for that full clinical support network would seem to make sense. But that it would need to be done in a way that isn't seem to undermine a senior clinician within yeah. the, 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 the same environment. I just wanted to kind of put that yeah. on the record. I will take that back. And Okay, thank you. Rhoda, do you have a, a, a question? Just, just on the appeals mechanism, it seems to me that you have a clinical decision, you can get a second opinion, and then you go to the medical director. All of those people given that opinion would be employees of the one NHS board. So if there was a conflict between funding, and it was used as a cost-saving exercise to move somebody out, the, the ombudsman cannot look at the clinical decision making only that the NHS board followed the complaints process correctly. So there is no independent opinion other than that without a financial um, burden attached to it. And how, how do you sort that out to make sure that it is looked at and the above suspicion of financial saving? Well, I mean, the reality is there, there is no big cost saving here so the driver behind that is um, is not there and we, it's very clear in the guidance that the decision making is clinical decision making and they must absolutely in fact the guidance is very clear on this take no account of any financial considerations now um, I actually think clinicians um, will you know they're part of their um, their duty in that regard is to look at the needs of, of the patient and actually I think they would, um, I would have full confidence that that is exactly what they will do um, and they will not be uh, looking at any other considerations um, because they're at, the guidance is very clear that they should not. So we, you know, that's why it's in the guidance that it's absolutely a clinical decision. No other consideration should be made. And uh, you know, as I say, as part of the review, 12 months down the line, we can we can check and probe that to make sure and reassure ourselves that there are no other issues being brought in. But you know, the guidance couldn't be clearer on that. To check and probe it because it's not. I mean, the, the ombudsman cannot do that because they are not 
they can't make a decision uh, based on a clinical judgment. They can't assess the decision made on a clinical judgment. So it's not just it's natural justice is not only being fair and we'd all hope that people would use the guidance properly, but it's also about being seen to be fair. Well, we could look, for example, of a sample of those cases that were asked for a second opinion or went to the medical director and to look whether there was anything different in terms of the, the way that those decisions were made, in terms of the outcome that would be different from elsewhere. That you know, And I think if there was something that uh, would um, stand out as a case that um, people would be thinking, well, that very strange to think that that person well although it would be very difficult to say that someone actually couldn't be uh, cared for in hospital if there was actually they couldn't be cared for anywhere else um, in the community and had to be cared for in hospital for that decision to be made in a different way the clinician would have to be thinking so where is this person going to be cared for um, but again if there's any um, decisions that uh, looked um, that they were out of kilter, if you like, then we could certainly look at those cases and perhaps do a sample of the ones that went to um, second and medical director opinion. But, you know, the guidance is very, very strong in this regard, that it is absolutely a clinical decision. And given, as we've already said on a number of occasions, there isn't a big cost saving here to the NHS. That money is then ploughed back into in integrated resources. So it's not as if a health board is going to make a saving that it can set against you know, financial pressures elsewhere. It's not. It's not going to operate like that. So. You want to? Yeah. Uh, just to also emphasise within that clinical decision, it's a multidisciplinary assessment. So um, clearly, ex the sort of expertise of caring for people in the community has a big say in that. And you know, you would think that if the multidisciplinary team, who are experts in community care, are saying actually we cannot care for this person in their own home, or we cannot care yeah. for that person in the care home, then that clinical decision is going to be influenced by that, and that will affect the judgment of whether somebody ca can can be in a hospital uh, or not. Uh, also, I think it's reasonable to say that all the continuing care uh, funding at the moment, um, the specialties that these people are in, are amongst the delegated functions. So the funding for all the patients, whether they be in care homes or whether they be in hospital at the moment, will be delegated to the IJBs. Uh, just to emphasise this, you know, we're not talking about transferring of money here from one statutory body to another. It will all fall under the Chief Officer's remit to make decisions on that budget. <coughs> Any other questions from, from the committee? And isn't? Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your attention, uh, attendance here today and uh, for your colleagues. Thank you very much. That concludes the Health, committee's, Health and Sport Committee's business for today. Thank you. Yay. That was a really good line of questions.